Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to our Astrobiology Program Town Hall. Uh, we are very excited to have everybody here today. Um, hopefully, there'll be some information that'll be useful for you, um, some things that you may be interested in and want to reach out uh, to, uh, or some information you may want to follow up on after this meeting, uh, some questions you may have, a whole bunch of different things that may interest you. Um, we have a number of great folks here to talk with you, both from the program, from the RCNs, um, from some of our Mars missions or our Mars planning. So hopefully uh, there'll be a little something for everybody today. Um, I, of course, am Lindsay Hayes. I hope that uh, at least some of you recognize me or have had a chance to talk with you or something in the past. Um, I am the program scientist for astrobiology here at NASA headquarters. Um, and our, our major thing that we're gonna start off, or the, uh, let's say it this way, the three things that we're gonna talk about today um, is, you know, sort of astrobiology on uh, astrobiology in NASA. Um, we're going to talk about sort of a new person that we have on board who we're pretty excited about. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, the astrobiology program at headquarters. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the RCNs and we'll get a briefing from each of them. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about a couple different Mars activities that are happening at headquarters um, and, and outside of headquarters as well. So the first thing that we're going to do today is I'm going to kick it off um, by having Daniela, or sorry, I'll be kicking it off by having David Grinspoon, um, our new senior scientist for astrobiology strategy. David, why don't you introduce yourself? All right. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is really exciting for me to uh, be here as the new senior scientist for astrobiology strategy. I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, we will attempt to, um, whoops, wasn't, that wasn't right, one second. Um, here we go. Uh, we'll attempt to uh, describe to you what that means to have a senior scientist for astrobiology strategy. Um, here we go. All right. Um, first of all, before I describe what this role is, I wanted to just briefly introduce myself um, because I know a lot of you know me, but some of you don't. Um, I'm a planetary scientist slash astrobiologist. My research has, um, through my career, has focused a lot on evolution of planetary okay. atmospheres, mostly terrestrial planets, but also uh, some icy moon atmospheres, surface atmosphere interactions, hydrospheres, biospheres, studied stable isotopes, uh, large impact events, um, and a few other things. Uh, I've been a PI on um, exobiology grants, uh, several other NASA research programs, a COI for the uh, Astrobiology Institute, uh, with a PI on the NSF uh, Life and Extreme Environments program, um, COI on a on Nexus, um, uh, exoplanets, atmospheres modeling um, project, um, and uh, a few other things. I've been on missions. I was an interdisciplinary science to Venus Express. Um, I'm a co-I on Da Vinci. I was a co-I on the, uh, actually the co-I for astrobiology on the RAD instrument on a, a Mars Science Laboratory. Um, I've been the science champion for uh, NASA mission studies. Um, and um, and also, as it says here, the, a co-I on many rejected mission proposals and a PI on two rejected uh, NAI lead team proposals, which um, as many of you know, is actually a, uh, a painful but but good experience as well. Um, at least two of my rejected mission proposals made it to phase A and then not phase B. So, um, anyways, uh, as far as a EPO, um, I was uh, I think the first curator of astrobiology at a major uh, American science museum, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I've taught astrobiology at uh, multiple universities and written books, op-eds, magazine pieces. Podcasts, planetarium shows, uh, online courses, all that stuff. Um, and then uh, as far as uh, other relevant activities, um, 
I was the inaugural Bloomberg chair, which is the chair of astrobiology at the Library of Congress, which, uh, by the way, was an amazing experience and is now open for applications for the next round. And um, I, I want to urge you, if you've ever thought of taking a sabbatical to work on a project that is astrobiology adjacent, but it has to do with humanities. Uh, it's a really amazing program. And it's we've we've emphasized outreach to um, to people from the humanities, uh, historians and, and others and so forth to try to get their numbers up. But it's open to scientists who have an interest in the humanities. And it's, it's really a great opportunity and uh, urge you to think about applying. I've been on science definition teams for missions and uh, decadal panels and written white papers. Anyway, this is all to say, um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, a member of your community who has now somehow found himself on the other side of the fence um, at NASA as the senior scientist for astrobiology strategy. Uh, we want to emphasize this is a new position, um, and we're uh, we've created new leadership roles, uh, which we'll endeavor to briefly describe to you. As the senior scientist for astrobiology strategy, I'm largely responsible for trying to expand the astrobiology program, um, both within NASA and, and beyond NASA in ways that um, I'll elaborate on in a minute. And we have two other new leadership roles, uh, program scientists for astrobiology, um, which uh, will be Lindsay Hayes, and Lindsay's going to come on in a minute and describe that to you in more detail, uh, and a deputy program scientist for astrobiology, which will be Becky McCauley Wrench. And they'll be responsible for running all the programs that you're already familiar with. And I will be primarily responsible for trying to expand astrobiology in various ways, which I'll now very briefly run through. Uh, this is, of course, as you know, a very exciting time for astrobiology. And um, the program is in great shape, thanks to the work of previous leadership and, and the really amazing team that we have here at headquarters and at the centers. Um, I, I'm not here to do any major surgery. <laughs> uh, the, the program doesn't need that. Uh, but there are opportuni opportunities for uh, new opportunities for uh, expanding astrobiology that, that we'll be talking about. Um, and of course, we're at an incredible time with the potential for making important new discoveries through interdisciplinary research. Um, and that potential has really never been higher. So some future directions I'm looking at. And remember, I'm the new guy. I've been here for a month. And so this is all notional. And I'm very interested in feedback and ideas. But uh, what I'm thinking about right now, um, I feel like the, the primary role that I really want to focus on is increased cross-divisional and cross-directorate activity in astrobiology at NASA. Um, the current divisional structure within SMD um, largely predates the discovery of exoplanets and the significant placement of the search for life as a cross-cutting theme for NASA science. So we have, of course, these silos, and there's a reason for that. Um, it works to have uh, different parts of our science uh, managed in different parts of NASA, but there's also a risk there that we we miss the cross-divisional opportunities. And so uh, a primary goal of mine is to raise visibility of the astrobiology program, increase connectivity, um, look to bolster existing activities with new models of support for interdisciplinary and cross-divisional research projects. Um, and uh, I can elaborate on that. I won't too much now, both in the interest of brevity and because I'm just starting, but I've, I can tell you I've had preliminary um, meetings with all of the science divisions at NASA, and there's a lot of recognition of uh, the poten untapped potential there. Uh, as well, there are um, possibilities of new interagency um, cooperation with, uh, for instance, with NSF um, primarily, but also other agencies. And I really want to look at revitalizing international connections and collaborations, which, you know, had great start with the NAI and have been a little bit dormant in the last few years. And some of that, you know, they're not all created equal, and some of them were more successful than others. But I think um, that's definitely, I want to look at which of those um, could perhaps use some uh, 
renewing and revitalization of those international partnerships. Um, Public-private partnerships, there are some really interesting efforts by some companies now to get into uh, astrobiology missions in some ways that uh, expand the repertoire uh, as far as risk posture from what NASA is used to doing. And I think it's worth um, looking at those and lending what help um, we can to some of those efforts. And uh, definitely want to um, take a fresh look at the role of astrobiology in NASA missions, the uh, all the way through from conception, through uh, proposing and selecting, through the science teams of the missions, and then the RNA programs. Uh, there's some obviously really exciting upcoming opportunities. And um, we just want to make sure that uh, participation of astrobiology astrobiology and the missions is where it should be. Um, other possible um, probable future directions, there's been a lot of um, work in the post-discovery planning and imagining as far as the communications. Um, as you know, there have been some recent activities with um, trying to um, come up with best practices for how we will uh, communicate discoveries that are on the path towards finding life. And those activities will continue. Daniela Solis will talk a little bit about that this afternoon. But also, I'm interested in the possibility of uh, doing more planning and imagining of post-discovery science. If we succeed in finding life, um, you know, of course, we, we phrase things a lot as that's what we're doing. We're on the quest for life. But if we succeed in some dramatic or, or gradual way, that is not the end, but it's a new beginning for astrobiology, uh, a new phase of comparative planetology that involves comparative biospheres and biochemistries and, and so forth. And, and what would that science look like? Um, I think it's worth our devoting some more attention to that. Um, I have an interest in, in uh, the connection between astrobiology and climate change, global sustainability, and so forth. Uh, as you know, we're, we are in a global climate crisis, and um, well, that's not exactly what we're focused on. There are some interesting connections. We as astrobiologists um, have a perspective on the role of life in global cycles, and uh, I think we have a contribution to make to that um, climate emergency. Um, in both science and outreach. And that relates in an interesting way to studies of the Anthropocene uh, as it relates to astrobiology, some of which I've been involved in. And that also verges into questions of the future of life and even techno signatures. What does it mean for a um, technological civilization to alter a planet, to become part of the way a planet operates? And is that something we can not only uh, participate in and imagine uh, on our own planet, but but uh, but um, search for and uh, be prepared to possibly find elsewhere? Um, and of course, we need to plan for the transformative potential of new technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, networked. Um, small satellites, uh, there's already, of course, amazing um, progress that's been made, for instance, using a, um, AI for uh, protein folding studies. And I think, uh, you know, nobody knows where it's going, but it's worth our um, devoting some attention and planning to how we're going to maximize these technologies in the future. Um, there's also, um, we've had some recent um, work done, um, we've been doing some work on ethical issues in uh, in our field work, um, which is an important question, of course, because uh, the places where we do field work are um, are owned by indigenous communities who care about um, those lands and who who have knowledge and wisdom that we ought to um, connect with. Um, and so this is activity that's going to continue. And um, Daniela Scalise, I think, is also going to uh, address this a little bit um, later this afternoon. Um, in addition to um, these new efforts, um, I will be uh, having strategic input into some of our existing programs. Uh, for instance, um, uh, additional looking at additional models of uh, support and structure for the RCNs. Um, we want to we want to look at uh, these questions: Are we maximizing the openness and transparency and 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 regular processes for the RCNs, or how can we improve that? And one thing I'm wondering about, and maybe I don't need to, but um, it, does the 
how does the RCN structure affect overall cohesiveness of the larger community? Is there any risk of sort of fracturing into separate communities? I've seen this happen with, uh, for instance, in planetary science with the, the ag structure, where, um, you know, we end up sort of inadvertently pitting the inner planets people against the, the outer planets or the icy moon people. And I don't think that's necessarily happening here. And of course, I want to acknowledge that not all of our research is contained within RCNs. I just think that's an interesting thing to look at beyond the RCN structure. How are we uh, maintaining cohesiveness as a larger community? Um, be, be taking a, a new look at the uh, relationship with the, the centers, astrology at the NASA centers, make sure that we're maximizing um, the, uh, the, the interaction with and use of the great talent we have beyond headquarters within NASA. Um, and then, of course, we have a great team here. And I think you know them uh, working on communication and engagement within NASA, within our scientific community, and, and with the publics. But that is also a major interest of mine. And so uh, I will um, be working and trying to help um, expand and um, just uh, enhance those efforts and, uh, and community building as well. So uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, we're looking very seriously at doing a new astrobiology strategy. Um, it's been a decade since the last astrobiology strategy document that, of course, Lindsay Hayes ran. Um, and a lot's happened in that decade. Of course, there's been a new decadal survey. Uh, we've had concrete evidence of habitable early environments on Mars. Dragonfly has been selected, and, and we're going to fly that to Titan. Uh, there's been some incredible discoveries uh, with exoplanets that, that, that Trappist-1 at multiple planets in the potentially habitable zone, just for an example, uh, and tremendous progress in understanding the biology and environmental evolution of the early Earth. Uh, all of this is new. Much of this is new since the last decadal, since the last astrobiology strategy. So we're, um, we don't have a definite plan, but it's something we're seriously considering and would love your, your input um, on that. And, and one thought I had would be that it might be fun and perhaps instructive when we do this to look, uh, at least for some part of the exercise, look more than 10 years ahead. I mean, one unique thing about our field is the long timelines of our investigations. Um, and that's, you know, sometimes frustrating, but also um, very exciting, the sort of multi-generational aspect. So it'd be interesting to uh, look farther, you know, 20 years from now, maybe we'll have samples back from multiple targets and uh, HW, HWO will be operating, we'll be planning new next generation of, of uh, space telescopes, and maybe we'll have multi have found multiple biosignatures, um, or, or maybe we won't. What, you know, what laboratory and analytical techniques might we have access to, and what, what would our science look like on that, that kind of time scale? So um, I want to wrap up here, turn things over to Lindsay, but I just want to um, finish by saying that, uh, you know, I'm just getting started. I'm the new guy. And and uh, my main first task is to listen and learn. I know I have a lot to learn. I really want your input and your feedback. Um, you know, what's working with the astrobiology program? What can be improved? How can NASA headquarters help? Uh, what? How can we make things run more smoothly, transparently? equitably, uh, what future directions and opportunities should we be attuned to? Um, I will be reaching out in multiple ways to try to um, have conversations and, and learn and listen and connect with you. I'm going to be attending uh, DPS and AGU, other meetings. I'm going to, um, I already have plans to visit a couple of your research centers, and I'm interested in um, visiting many of them and meeting with the RCN leads. Uh, you know, one question is uh, about Town halls like this. Uh, what should we do in the future? What What do you think about the cadence uh, and the format, and what kind of topics should be raised? Um, and along those lines, I'm going to be. Um, I think I'm going to start holding uh, what I call office hours, uh, which I'll, I'm going to have regular time. It might be Friday, 11 to 2, but stay tuned. I'll let you. You all know when I will just be um, in my office um, for people in the community to uh, make appointments and talk about whatever you want to talk about, um, just as another means of getting feedback. And I think Lindsay, we were talking, I think Lindsay's planning on starting something like this as well. So we're both really interested in um, hearing um, what you have to say about all this. And um, so with that, um, I thank you for listening, and I'm going to now uh, turn things back to Lindsay.
Thanks, David. And I've said it before, but welcome again. We're really, we're really happy to have you. Um, so I'm going to share and give some present, give a bit of my presentation as well. Um, and I'm actually going to start uh, with a quick note. Um, that is, you may have noticed a little bit of awkwardness at the start. Um, there is actually a tiny bit of a lag in our presentation between what we're actually talking and what you guys out in YouTube land are seeing. Um, and so uh, that means that um, I'm telling you now that uh, there is, of course, uh, the question and answer section that you can see in the agenda. Uh, uh, we will be taking questions at that point, um, but because of the sort of lag, if you want to start adding those questions in the YouTube chat now, um, we'll be ready to have those all queued up and ready to answer during that point in the agenda. Um, with regard to the agenda, if we do wrap a section early and there aren't a lot of questions that are coming in, um, we actually will just take a pause um, so that we will start everything on the time that it says in the agenda, um, so that if people are joining us at a particular time, they're not going to miss anything. And then finally, just one other note, programmatic note, um, the recording will be available afterwards. So if you ever want to go back and look at something that we talked about, um, it's available there. So thank you all for that. Um, again, thanks for the introduction or for the, the handover, David. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the program, the astrobiology program, and, and my role as the, the program scientist for astrobiology. So um, this is an org chart that we really wanted to show as a way to really explain um, sort of how we are seeing NASA headquarters astrobiology structured um, from this point and going forward. Um, so the first thing to note, of course, is that there are two things or two boxes under that first sort of umbrella of NASA headquarters astrobiology. Um, there is the senior scientist for astrobiology strategy. That, of course, is David. There's the program scientist for astrobiology. That's me. Um, and then we have a deputy, the deputy program scientists for astrobiology. There's more of a direct connection uh, within the program, um, but of course, you know, Becky and myself and David are all really working together um, for this NASA headquarters astrobiology. Um, so there's a there's sort of a, a table um, uh, at the legend at the bottom that shows what the different font sizes and what the different lines are. Um, we are aware that this looks like a bad plumbing map um, with lots of things going to all different kinds of places. Uh, but if you follow with me, I'll try and sort of walk us through this. So of course, we have um, the sort of the sort sort of three different uh, roles that David mentioned um, up at the top here. Um, David was sort of talking about, you know, his sort of future connections within SMD, interagency, international commercial connections. Um, that all sort of sits within his bucket here. If you follow the red, uh, the red lines down here, you'll see he also has a direct link uh, to both NASA Center Astrobiology as well as communications and engagement. Now, NASA Center Astrobiology are the sort of civil servant and contractor researchers at the center division, sectional management, and senior scientists um, that we have at different NASA centers. Within the communications box, um, these are uh, contractors, and, and I, I welcome folks when I say their names to turn on their camera and remind you um, of these people that you know, and of course will continue to remain part of the astrobiology program. Folks like Daniela Scalise, Mike Toyon, Aaron Gronstel, Anthony Chen, uh, Marco Bolt, Tahira Allen, Linda Billings, Svet Shokular, um, and additional contractors and interns who we have. Um, who are fantastic people who are really doing a lot of great work uh, within the astrobiology program and, and are, you know, we're really happy that they're part of our team. Um, move over one box. And of course, we have the early career programs. Um, the early career programs are really championed by Melissa Kerbin Brooks at, at Ames Research Center. Um, she's a, you know, a, a great advocate for all of these things um, and will continue to be part of the astrobiology program. Um, if we move over here to the research coordination networks, um, here we would have, you know, the headquarters reps for the astrobiology uh, research coordination networks, myself, Becky McCauley Wrench, et cetera. Um, and then um, all the way on the right here is the astrobiology research portfolio. This is technically under the leadership of the PSD RNA lead. This is within um, Stephen Reinhardt's sort of management as the PSD RNA lead. Um, it's worth, of course, noting that Stephen Reinhardt is about to go on a detail starting on October 1st. Uh, to the White House for a year. Um, and so Delia Santiago Matariz and Kathleen Vander Caden uh, will be uh, sort of joint occupying that role, working together, um, serving as each other's deputies at different times. Um, and so, you know, all of the astrobiology research portfolio is within the PSD research and analysis program. Um, and so what happens there, of course, is that recommendations for selections from myself, Becky, Jeff Wheat, all go into that research portfolio. This is how it has always operated and will continue um, 
um, will, will continue to operate even as we sort of reorganize some of the other connections here. And then finally, um, last of course, but not least here is DEIA activities. And this is sort of separated out. Um, we have uh, Daniela Scalise, Aaron Gronstel, and Melissa Kerbin Brooks are the folks that really work on this a lot for us within the astrobiology program. But there's connections here, of course, to communications, to early career programs, to the RCNs and the research portfolio. And so it's worth, of course, noting that, um, you know, there's a lot of different things, but the red connections here are the things that we really see as, um, you know, as part of the, the strategic side of the, of the grouping here. Um, and the, this yellow orange line um, is the way we see connections to the programmatic side. So I hope this sort of helps people to, to really um, have a visual sense of what, uh, what David and myself and Becky uh, will be responsible for and working with and, and sort of working to develop um, in this sort of new model. So my next slide, um, I'm going to go just a little bit to remind folks of our RNA and to give folks some updates if it's uh, been a while or, or you know any sort of thing there. We, of course, have the exobiology, the sort of original uh, base for the astrobiology research portfolio. This is, of course, uh, understand the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. This research is focused um, sort of the origin, evolution of life, potential of life to adapt, implications of life elsewhere. We have these sort of five areas of research emphasis. Um, the exobiology program is, of course, solicited annually, and it's a no due dates program. And that really means that you should submit the proposal um, when it's ready, when you have it ready, when you feel that it's ready for review. Um, one of the things that means is that we've actually been able to get down our uh, response time on these um, and way down from previous years. And so we've been able to really get on average responses back uh, quite fast um, down to, I think my my record at one is for this, uh, a three month response based on sort of when we wound up having the evaluations and everything. So, you know, we're really moving things fast here. Um, one note here is that because of the way that we do the reviews, uh, we really put some uh, additional emphasis on external reviews. So if you get an email from myself or Jeff Wheat um, or somebody else asking for you to do an external review, please, if you're pos if possible, please help us out there. Um, of course, we typically select 20 to 25 programs or proposals a year for exobiology. Habitable worlds um, for, you know, sort of the, the counterpoint uh, to exobiology. If you think of exobiology as being interested in the, the micros and the organisms and that sort of thing, habitable worlds is really interested in the environments, right? We're trying to understand the history of the earth and the life on it as a way to understand processes, conditions that maintain habitable environments um, and search for these environments um, off, off away from the earth, that kind of thing. This also is an annual program. Um, we did skip a year a couple years ago, um, but this is an annual program. Um, in the step one due dates are coming up um, in November. You can see the dates there. Uh, you then submit a step two proposal uh, in uh, February of next year. Note, of course, that Habitable Worlds is a dual anonymous peer review program, which means there's a particular way that we ask you to write the proposal um, so that the majority of the body of the text um, doesn't really focus on who is proposing the research, but re the focusing on the research itself. And then we sort of have a two-stage review process where we focus first on the research itself um, with sort of trying to remove emphasis um, about who is the proposers. And then once that uh, analysis is done and we have all those scores, then we get into focusing like, okay, well, you know, are the team that is proposing to do this work really capable of doing it? So there is a point where the individuals are um, looked at and considered, um, but it's the science first and then the individuals. And this is a smaller program. We typically solicit five or typically select five to 10 proposals a year. There's, of course, PSTAR, Planetary Science and Technology Through Analog Research. Uh, the focus here is investigations exploring relevant environments to develop a technical and scientific basis to conduct astrobiologically, astrobiolog yeah, astrobiological research on other solar system bodies. Um, this is a science-driven exploration program, and it's really interested um, in the next generation of planetary astrobiological exploration. Um, and the teams here will become, um, will become members of one or more RCNs. Um, this is solicited biennially, so it's an every other year program. Um, the step one due dates, the step ones were already uh, due this year. Um, so if you miss that, unfortunately, you're not eligible uh, until two years from now. Uh, but if you did submit a step one, uh, we're hoping to get letters out very soon um, and let you know uh, who should submit a step two. 
Next one um, is ICAR. Uh, proposals here that describe a multi-million dollar five-year project. These are the bigger, this is sort of the bigger sister to the exobiology program, let's say. Um, for projects larger than the scope of the individual research programs, but within the scope of research coordination networks, um, and all selected teams here become members of one or more relevant RCNs. Um, we are not soliciting this in ROSES 23, um, but we uh, are intending, we hope to be able to solicit it in ROSES 24. Um, and I'll note, of course, that with the relevant RCNs, we will actually be um, having each of the new ICAR awards, um, giving an, a little opportunity to talk about that research as part of the presentations for the RCNs um, in the next round. But of course, note that it is not just the ICAR awardees that become members of the RCNs. Um, any NASA-funded research project, regardless of the program that it's funded from, um, that are relevant to the RCNs can be eligible to join these RCNs. So if you're in exobiology or habitable worlds or PSTAR um, or other things that are not you know, even sort of directly part of the astrobiology research portfolio, um, emerging worlds, exoplanets research program, some of the programs in um, the earth science division or the uh, other programs in the astrophysics division or other programs um, in, ha in uh, the heliophysics division, all of these, if their research that you're doing is relevant to one of the topics of the RCNs, um, you know, we'd really, as part of that coordination activity, we'd really love to see you join. So I'm going to talk a little bit now that moving on from the portfolio, talk a little bit about additional astrobiology activities. Um, one thing to talk about is the Nexus assessment. Um, we had an assessment of our very first RCN um, that was undertaken in early 2023. Uh, it was a cross-divisional review panel co-led by Nicole Zellner and Mark Marley. And thank you again uh, for both the co-leads um, as well as the panel and, and Bradley Burkar, who served as the executive secretary. The intent of the Nexus assessment was to assess the overall success of Nexus with regards to the goals that it had made it for itself at the start, um, gather lessons learned from the first six years of operation and all of the different things that it had done, Coll and then, of course, collect information regarding the challenges that Nexus has faced, and, and really think about these things as a proxy uh, for things to be learned um, and to assist as well in things that we may want to do with the other RCNs. So some of the key findings from this, uh, Nexus has demonstrably catal catalyzed interdisciplinary community interactions in ways that have benefited the community, including observing campaigns, modeling, and input into CATL surveys. Nexus is of high value for early career researchers involved in the program. And then, of course, additionally, um, you know, there's some areas that were identified as improvement and things that we at NASA headquarters are going to sort of undertake some uh, considered ways that we may want to, to look and to, to see this improvement through, um, including representation um, in the different uh, topical, topical aspects of it, um, how to convey the mission statement, um, how to make sure that the leadership structure and the selection process work well, um, and then and of course, uh, you know, sort of this all volunteer model and how can we make sure to have some support? And so we intend to report, release the report in the NASA response soon. So uh, stay, stay uh, attuned to that. Um, unfortunately, Becky McCauley Wrench was unable to join us any today. She's had an addition to the family and we're very excited for her. So I'm Presenting on her behalf about the 2023 Astrobiology Mission Aviation Factory, which just wrapped up a couple weeks ago. Um, as you can see, it happened at Goddard um, in late in August. Uh, no innovation was contracted to sort of operate this whole this this ideation factory. There are 32 participants from the U.S. and international, uh, from first year graduate students all the way through to early career faculty. Many different institutions, cross disciplinary ideas. Um, the output was um, six mission ideas that were presented at the week, at the end of the week by teams of three to seven individuals. They had seven different mentors who were able to come in and sort of help out in that process. And they're planning a follow-up activity, or we are planning a follow-up activity, phase two, to work on some mock data and sort of think about how we would how we would go forward sort of the next steps here. Um, the hope is that this is sort of a start in a way to sort of uh, get more uh, early career folks involved and interested and aware of the process uh, for mission formulation all the way through to operation. And so we're particularly excited about, uh, about how well this went and thank everybody who was um, mentors and attendees and all of that and, and hope, look forward to where it's going to go next. 
Um, and then the last thing I'm going to speak about today is an upcoming biosignatures ideas lab. Now, this one is going to be a lot more of our traditional ideas lab. Uh, the idea is that you start with an input, a grand challenge topic, creative people, um, some money from the program. You create an environment, an ideas lab um, that's a sort of sand pit that really um, works through some really I interesting ideas that fosters creativity. Um, and the hope is that the output is a potentially transformative, novel, adventurous, innovative, interdisciplinary ideas with the wow factor. And we're really going to focus this one on, on biosignatures and biosignature research. Um, sort of how this is involved, we have mentors that focus on the topic, facilitators that focus on the process, and then participants. Um, you have a sort of three-day residential sit, sand pit, uh, real-time peer review, and then three virtual meeting days that leads to a, a, a few project ideas that are, that are the sort of ones that become selected. Um, and then in a couple months, they work and submit full proposals. So the idea is that more information will be coming this fall about this and the idea that it will take place in early 2024. And so that is the end of my slide, but there's one more um, astrobiology program activity um, that we want to tell you about, and I'm going to use that as a way to transition to our uh, next group, um, which is Daniela and Erin. So Daniela, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Lindsay. I'm going to bring slides up here and attempt to go full screen. So if someone wants to pop in and let me know it's going, that would be great. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Daniela. I'm very excited to be with you. We have some wonderful things we wanna share with you today. Um, as, as David mentioned earlier, there's a workshop that's gonna be coming up in the first two weeks of February, 2024, and it follows on. It's not exactly the same. It picks up new and different themes and will be quite different, but it's gonna follow on from the standards of evidence workshop that many of you I'm sure were part of in 2021. And we're calling it communicating about the discovery of extraterrestrial life. As many of you are probably also feeling in your bones, the discovery may not be as far off as we once thought it was. And so we want to organize ourselves and the community broadly and, and probably everyone to be prepared for when the discovery is made and to talk about discoveries that are going to lead up to it in the, in the ensuing uh, years and perhaps decades. So we want to start pursuing the organizing ourselves um, to communicate about this, these discoveries, especially the big one. So our aim with this workshop is to bring together both the astrobiology scientific community and the science communication community broadly. And we're talking about what we've been calling traditional sort of print publication journalism along all along the spectrum through social media and other types of communicators of science. Bring these two communities together to exchange perspectives about the potential discovery, the eventual, if you like, discovery of life beyond Earth. So we're bringing together two very different worlds that, that have interfaced a lot over the years, um, and we want to sort of enhance that interface if we can. So our, our goal is to explore what we consider is a mutually beneficial and socially responsible path forward in communicating about the discovery of extraterrestrial life. Uh, we feel that everybody has responsibilities. Um, this is powerful and potent information that's in our hands as the scientific community. And we need to come together as professionals and colleagues across the science and science communication worlds to communicate this discovery um, appropriately and respectfully and responsibly. And we want to create, with this workshop, we hope that we will be creating a lasting uh, community of shared interest um, as we walk the journey toward this discovery. Applications for this workshop are open now. Um, the URL is there, and uh, we're going to put it in the chat for you as well. So applications will be due November 15th, I believe it is mid-November, and we're going to have um, selections made shortly after that. Again, looking at the first two weeks of February, um, with, I believe, three days in each week. Um, the rest of that is TBD at this time. But looking forward to being with you in that workshop in a few months. Okay, we're going to move on from here. Aaron is going to join me online. And this is uh, to share with you a few things um, about some policy and requirements and, and ideas, really, um, towards, our, towards changing our approach uh, in our scientific culture. Uh, about our relationship with fieldwork 
and our ethics around that relationship. So I'm going to start and then Aaron's going to take over. One of the first things we want to share with you is that last November, so almost a year ago, an truly amazing document appeared in our world called Federal Guidance for Departments and Agencies on Indigenous Knowledge. Um, it came out of a joint effort out of the White House, uh, OSTP, Office of Science and Technology Policy, collaborating with the Council on Environmental Quality. It had almost 100% Indigenous leadership in the authoring of this document, and it's, in my opinion, tremendous. These are some of the three main points that have come out of it. Um, guidance from the highest part of the federal government is being offered to agencies to, that we should undertake to understand what Indigenous knowledge is. We should be investing in growing and maintaining relationships with tribal nations and Indigenous communities um, in order to appropriately include Indigenous knowledge in everything we do. And we need to be considering, including, and applying Indigenous knowledge in everything we do. So basically, we need to know what it is, build relationships in order to include it in our work. So this was a truly a seminal document. I've been doing this a long time. I haven't seen anything like this. And we're just thrilled that this has come through. The other thing that has um, come through on the scene over the last couple of years um, that is sort of emergent with this guidance is some pretty uh, egregious abuse of field sites. This is definitely not the norm, as you know, in our fieldwork community, but um, some pretty headline-grabbing uh, behavior um, where there was oversampling uh, in some rocks on indigenous lands, got some pretty big press. And it got our attention because this is something we we just absolutely do not want to see happen on our watch. We don't want to see this happen um, with our funding. And we want to just be part of a movement within our communities with you all to evolve our ethics, to make sure that that we're doing things in a good way, especially with respect to indigenous lands, waters, and skies. So our thinking has 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 roots in the excellent field site ethics that have already been developed with respect to participant health and safety, how we treat each other in the field, codes of conduct, um, things like that, and with respect to the impact that our activities have on the environment of the site. There's a lot of amazing work out there, and I think everybody is behaving in a good way with respect to each other and the land itself. And, and to first order, our operating principle is that we know that you love your field sites just as much as everyone else uh, who loves the site loves it. So we wanna build on, on these good things and introduce more consideration, deeper consideration of historical and cultural significance of some of these sites, uh, in particular with respect to indigenous relationship to the land. Um, I will go ahead and step out and say uh, what I think the truth to be, which is that every single inch of land, water, and sky on this continent, known as North America, at least, and many other places, as we know, the indigenous, the colonized world is vast. These lands are indigenous lands, whether or not um, there's a piece of paper somewhere that says they own them. They just are. It's just part of the truth of history. So we want to invite our community into a deeper consideration of what that means with respect to our responsibilities as scientists, as guests, if you will, on those lands. And of course, the scientific value and long-term preservation and heritage of our sites. Okay, I think this is where I'm handing it over to you, Aaron. Okay, hey, hello everyone. Um, so within the program, we've kind of been looking at ways to address all of these developments in uh, field ethics and, and the guidance that we've gotten from the White House and, and places. Um, we've developed this policy um, here. Uh, it was introduced into ROSES uh, 22 uh, for PSTAR. So some of you may have seen this language already and, and are familiar with it. Um, but now in ROSES 2023, it's an Appendix C under the Planetary Science Research Program. So yeah. now anything within planetary science at NASA um, dealing with fieldwork uh, this this applies to. Um, and the policy didn't just materialize on its own. Uh, we we did, did develop it within the astrobiology program, and uh, the PAC has recently made a finding in support of its development and the impl implementation. Um, so now 
what we're doing now is uh, continuing work on guidance for both proposers and reviewers uh, around this language and, and kind of in the process of getting that approved to go out to everyone. And what that guidance is, is like th these are sort of a couple questions pulled from the guidance so far. Um, these aren't requirements. This is this is meant uh, more as a support package uh, for proposers and reviewers. It also includes, includes resources and examples of how to work with indigenous communities and other cultural groups. Um, and more more suggestions of what to think about if you're stuck in, in, in kind of addressing that, the new actual requirement uh, within ROSES. Um, this process and the, and the new language will also help us hopefully highlight amazing work that is being done within the community and and kind of give us data and information on how to, how to respond to the guidance from the White House and, and places like that. Um, We'd like to, to really kind of show how, how our community is responding and, and evolving to understand our role in, in both the research and in the communities that we're all within broadly. So um, I guess keep an eye out for that. Um, we're looking at things of, you know, are there are there alternative sites that you could use? Have you, are you making use of, of uh, sample libraries that exist? You know, kind of that question of like, do you really need to be there or, and, and why you need to be there? Um, and also really paying attention to the history of the place and scientific research that's been done there. Is this a site where that's used by a lot of people? Are, there, are you in communication with the people that have used the site before? And, and you know, what is the scientific heritage of that site and how to maintain that? And then, of course, you know, the cultural proven, pro, provenance of the site and, you know, which indigenous people or tribal nations hold history on that land is there an opportunity to communicate with those people and, you know, obtain permissions from cultural groups, even if permits aren't required? And a big one is, is do you need help? Do you need our help? What, what can we do? And so that last one is in bold because that's sort of what we hope to reach is sort of a bare minimum of, of how we operate um, with our work. And do you need help in ensuring that free, prior, and informed consent has been achieved? And this is, that's kind of a statement that a lot of uh, indigenous communities use and are requesting and 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 put and putting out there as a, as a hope for for sort of collaboration and, and communication. And uh, moving forward, also we really really would be interested in talking with people from within the community at all experience levels um, in terms of your field work and and learning about what you've encountered uh, with respect with respect to field ethics and where we can provide support and what role we should play uh, as the astrobiology program. Um, and we're really kind of interested in early career people and and how you envision the future of field work and the future of field ethics and and everything you do in your research. So we're hoping to kind of build a community about around best practice. Um, I think this is a real opportunity to make sure our work is benefiting as many people as possible and to learn more about where we work and how our work affects affects people. So yeah, it's moving moving toward building those new collab collaborations and healthy inter interactions. And um, so please reach out to us if, if you wanna talk to us or, you know, hopefully we can, set up some interviews with people and maybe, you know, some community events around around this topic. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron and Daniela. Appreciate uh, that input and I, it's a very important topic. So thank you very much for chatting about it. Um, I think it's now time for a little bit of a Q&A. So, um, Daniela, were you gonna ask the question and we can, and David and I can answer what we're able to? Yes, okay. We have some good questions. Thank you all for participating in the chat with questions. Okay, first off, do exoplanet biosignatures fit within exobiology or habitable worlds? The scope documents are not fully clear. So that's a great question. Um, I would say that broadly and most significantly, exoplanet biosignatures as a biosignature um, fits within the exobiology column. Um, if you are looking at exoplanets as a way to understand their the planet's habitability, um, then that's more of a habitable worlds question. But if you're really trying to understand, you know, what would a biosignature look like, um, and what would you know, how would you understand life, um, or how would you look at a biosignature as a way to understand life on another planet? Um, that's a that's an exobiology. So again, the, the 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 easiest way to think about the difference is exobiology is really trying to understand, you know 
universal life, the features of life that we can imagine are there, um, regardless of where that life exhibits or exists, rather. Um, and Habitable Worlds is really focusing on the environments. What are the environments like? How does a habitable environment uh, uh, originate, form, continue um, on a planet somewhere else? Awesome. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, we have another question that um, is showing some interest in synthetic, bi astrosynthetic biology. Is anyone in our community working on this? Um, you know, I think that uh, the best way to find out whether or not folks in the community are working on this is to sort of uh, look out and see. But the way that we use, uh, the way that we sort of think about synthetic biology um, as a way to understand sort of novel groups, novel environments, that type of thing, um, certain aspects of that can be funded through exobiology. Um, but, you know, it's it's certainly not a, a large um, and, 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 you know, sort of major aspect of our, of the, you know, sort of major research thrust. Um, there is, you know, one individual whose name um, was put forth is Lynn Rothschild is an individual who works on something like this. So, uh, David, do you want to, um, do you have any other comments on this one as well? Uh, well, I think uh, Steve Benner's group also has done some interesting work um, with regard to uh, synthetic biology. And of, of course, um, you know, writ large, it, it, it does fit into astrobiology. If somebody has a, you know, a, a brilliant idea as to how to research it. Uh, don't don't shy away from uh, proposing it to us because you can't uh, don't think you can find the right program. You know we're we're interested and we can we can help you find the right program if if need be. That's actually a great point and, and one I'd like to, to sort of double down on and emphasize, and that is, you know, the program officers uh, for the different research programs are listed at the end of the call, and there's always a point of contact listed. And I always encourage individuals to reach out to their program officers um, ahead of submissions. If they have any questions, I try and get, um, you know, I get, I get a good number of questions related to exobiology, potential research, um, and try and answer as many of them as quickly as I am possible or am capable of doing, rather. Um, but, the, you know, the program officers are a great resource for that type of information. Is this kind of research really more appropriate for this? Does it fit in exobiology? Does it fit somewhere else? That kind of question. So, you know, reach out to your program officers. They are there to help. Okay, thank you. We have a question that I think has been resolved in the chat, but yes. it's how do we apply to the ideas lab? So thank you for your interest in that. And I believe the link was posted well, for you in so the chat, but go ahead. I, I do believe uh, I do believe the I, so the ideas lab as different from the communicating discoveries. Um, the biosignatures ideas lab. Uh, the website is not live. That the the information that I have is just a little bit more of a hey heads up this is coming and you know you know this space uh, this space to be filled soon. Um, so the best way to get the link when it's available is to sign up for the astrobiology program mailing list because we will definitely be sending that out um, on that mailing list um, and and alerting folks who may be interested in that. So um, no link yet, link coming soon. The best way to find it is to sign up for the Astrobiology Program email list or just to continue to check uh, the Astrobiology Program website. There's always fun things to be found there. Okay, thank you. So just to clarify, we do not have a link yet for the Ideas Lab um, application. Right. A link to apply for the workshop for communicating about the discovery of extraterrestrial life has been put in the chat. Excellent. Okay, excellent. And everyone is encouraged to sign up for the Astrobiology Program listserv. And I'm sure links will be, be put in the chat repeatedly. So <laughs> please do look for that. Thank you. Okay, we have a few more questions. Um, there's a question that is showing some concern about the PSTAR um, mm -hmm. program element. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on with the funding and proposal opportunities for PSTAR, please? Yeah. So so I'm going to sort of back up and, and rather than specifically talk about PSTAR, just talk about the astrobiology program research proposal, you know, sort of writ large, you know, and just say that, um, you know, we try to be responsive within that proposal um, to the types of research that uh, support, that are benefited by and that benefit 
you know, going forward our missions. Um, and so that sometimes means some sort of active proposal management or active portfolio management rather, and thinking about exactly where the research funding is. Um, and so, you know, trying to make sure that that's balanced, that the needs and the import of all of the different things that are within the astrobiology program um, get funded and get the amount of funding that we're able to pull forward within the budgetary environment that we have. So, you know, I think, I think the answer is, you know, we would love to give all of the money to all of the good research that's out there. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the budgetary environment that we're in. And we're really trying to make sure that, that we benefit and that we, that we balance that as much as possible uh, to be responsive to NASA's mission. Great. Thank you. OK, a few more questions coming. Sure. There's a question about smaller scale funding opportunities. Do we have that in our portfolio? And we may need clarity on that, Julia, but why don't you guys go ahead? Well, I'll say in terms of research, um, there is no minimum required <laughs> for how much you request to propose for a proposal. Um, so if you are interested in, you know, a research proposal that's one year and that's only going to cost, you know, a minimal number of dollars, there is no reason not to submit it to exobiology. Um, you know, we have an average, you know, amount, but you don't have to, you don't have to meet the minimum to be, to be a part of the club. Um, really and truly, you know, anybody who is interested in, in a research project um, you know, of, of the size that is appropriate should submit to the research program that they're interested in. Um, we do, in both Habitable Worlds and Exobiology, we have the option to propose a, a pilot study, which is sort of an intentionally, look, this is a small project. I'm really just trying to sort of do a proof of concept um, and put that together. And so, you know, that's always an option in Exobiology and Habitable Worlds. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, next question. Why were Ocean Worlds RCNs requested but none selected? Actually, um, we will have a um, Ocean World, uh, an Ocean World relevant ICAR award, which I think is actually what the question is about, is about ICAR, um, that will be talking um, and talking about the research that they will be working on um, when the RCNs come up in just a little bit, um, as soon as we finish the question and answer section here. So um, stay tuned and you will see. Okay, great. And just in case it was more about the RCNs, we do have an Ocean Worlds related RCNs. So, and you'll hear more about that soon as yes. well. <laughs> All right, thanks. cool. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah. Okay. Next question is for Aaron. It's for you and I. Has the astrobiology program looked into Section 106 guidelines for treatment of cultural sites under the National Historic Preservation Act? The guidelines would definitely have applicability for astrobiology work. Uh, field work sites. Yes, Linda, thank you so much. We have, and we are definitely um, going to be ensuring that Section 106 is referred to in the support package that we create for, for proposers. Thank you. Okay, Melissa, the next question is for you. Can international graduate students participate in early career programs? You're on mute, Melissa. We can't actually hear you. So sorry. We got you now. Oh, got you now. oh okay. Um, yeah, there are some that there are accessible things like the NPP program is fine. If the international student is affiliated with a U.S. institution, that's fine. It, it depends. So they're all pretty clearly marked. If there's any questions, just reach out to me. I'm melissa.curvin at nasa.gov. Thanks. We'll put your uh, info in the chat, Melissa. Thank you. Okay, we are going to pause questions for now and back over to you, Lindsay and David. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so thanks for thanks for hosting the questions, Daniela. Um, we are only a couple minutes behind, and so with this, I am going to uh, pass it over uh, to Karen Rogers, who hopefully will be able to turn on her camera um, at the very least, be able to uh, maybe share slides or chat with us. Um, who will give the introduction uh, to the RCNs? I can see. I saw her pop on for just a moment. So can you guys hear me at least? We can definitely hear you, yes. This is progress. I'm gonna turn <laughs> on my camera, but God knows I just got a new webcam and so it's unlikely to work with Microsoft Teams. <laughs> life, life cannot go that well. Um, but let me go ahead and start sharing my slides. Just give me a minute. 
um, well, I figure this all out. You know how it goes. I did mean to do this before. Um, do I have? Sorry, everybody. I did try into this before, but everything was broken then. We'll go to this mode. I don't need to add a background. Why? Why? Somebody quickly help me with Microsoft Teams and tell me where to click. Oh. Go to security and privacy screen recording to give permission. Anybody know? Got it. Sure. Yes, sure. You should. Oh. Yeah. I'm almost there. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, no, it has me quit and reopen. That doesn't seem like a good thing. Why don't we, um, Karen, why don't we give you just a minute? Oh, oh, we have it. It's working. There you go. Fantastic. Okay. We see your whole screen, but that's a great start. How about if I do that? Excellent. Thank okay. you very much. Sorry. Sorry about all the confusion there. I can't see anything um, except for my PowerPoint, so you'll have to bear with me and sort of yell at me um, if, uh, if, if I'm going over time. So... Lindsay asked me to give sort of a quick overview of the RCNs, and then I'll um, slide right into the RCN that I co-lead, which is PCE3. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll do this pretty quickly. I, I'm starting to put these slides together, and I got really nostalgic about um, sort of how I got into astrobiology. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Karen Rogers. I'm up here at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York. Um, I study extreme life and prebiotic chemistry. And I'm gonna sort of take you through the, the sort of RCN bit. I was putting these together and I was thinking back to the very first astrobiology science conference I went to. I was in grad school. Um, I was very early in grad school. And we were, for those of you who were there or remember, we were in tents um, at NASA Ames Research Center at Moffett Field. Um, this was back in 2000, so almost 25 years ago now, uh, a quarter of a century. And it has been really quite a ride. Um, this, there was an article written by Timothy Kroll who wrote this up, and I just loved some of these quotes that I wanted to share. This particular meeting differed from other origins of life and exobiology meetings in size because it was 500 people instead of the typical 100 or 200 participants. Um, and then this part is great. Being the first astrobiology conference created an excitement in the air, as if a new science had been born and the participants were in the delivery room. And that's, I think that's pretty spot on um, for sort of the beginnings 25 years ago, but it also really gives this historical perspective on sort of why astrobiology is sort of in this midst of really sort of going through an evolution. It's because it's been um, almost 25 years. And so um, here are some pictures actually from the conference that happened four years later. It was the third one. You can see the tents are still there in the background. There's uh, Chris McKay and, and Lynn Rothschild. And you know, we were out at the first one, we were out at a, this Irish pub and one of, the, one of the geochemists said to me, you know, wouldn't it be great if we got all of us who are, you know, some of us work on carbon and appetite and some of us work on, you know, microbes at the bottom of the ocean. Wouldn't it be great if we could fund a bunch of big programs so these people could get together? And of course, that had started just two years ago, and that's when the NAI began. And I would say that really sort of launched um, the astrobiology community we know today. Of course, it's been a long 25 years. Uh, the astrobiology conferences have gotten much bigger. We're up to nearly, I think, 1,100 was what we were at in Atlanta. And that the community has grown, um, the conferences have grown, the, the entire astrobiology program has grown. I've, I've benefited from that, right? I, I started when it was barely a thing, and, and now I'm, I'm sitting here and we're all sitting here. And I'm really, I'm really quite amazed at the fact that we did give birth to a scientific community and it has grown into that. That is largely because of the hard work of everybody at headquarters, everybody out there, and really under the phenomenal leadership and, and guidance of, of Mary Wojtek. Um, I think it's interesting that Mary is now at NASA Ames. I hope there aren't still the tents up from, from 1996. Uh, the thing about this evolution is that the the entire community has grown so much that the program has had to change. And that's really, I think, what sort of inspired the, the RCNs. And so when I came in, this is sort of what astrobiology looked like. Um, we had, I think I grabbed most of these programs and got them kind of correct. 
Um, you know, we had the NAI teams that were funded by NAI. We had Exobiology, Emerging Worlds, PSTAR. They've changed names a little bit over time. And then there was everybody else, and they're sort of all in the gray, right? Um, every Astrobiology is quite, quite, sort of quite large and, and has quite a bit of disciplinary breadth. And what happened over time is that all of us happened, right? There's so many more of us now that it was hard to get together in those 100 or 200 person meetings and really talk to each other. And so astrobiology needed a little restructuring so we could talk to each other again. And, and the way that was done was through the research coordination networks. They're organized by topic now. And so those of us who work on say origins of life, we're in one RCN, we kind of all get to talk together, but we talk to the folks who work on exoplanets, which is the Nexus RCN. And we also talk to the biosignature folks and they talk to the ocean world folks and they talk to the um, life evolution folks. And so what I think of as the RCNs is really just a restructuring to make sure we maintain these communities that we've built um, but still are small enough that we can, that we can have real conversations. Um, it's a piece of our success that we've grown so big that we that we really sort of needed to have this this ability to talk to each other. So here are the logos for all the five RCNs. I'll take you through them really quickly. So there's uh, the Nexus RCN. That's our very first one. It was established in 2016. Um, that was followed by PCE3. That's Prebiotic Chemistry and Early Earth Environments. Um, and then Enfold, which is the Network for Life Detection, and now the Network for Ocean Worlds. Um, and finally, the, the Life RCN, which is Early Cells to Multicellularity. And you'll hear from everybody there um, in each of those in just in just a few minutes. And the the um, the image you have on the bottom uh, is is something that you know we NASA uses all the time. I actually stole it off the NASA Astrobiology website. So thank you everybody for for putting this together. And it kind of helps to map the mission of NASA Astrobiology and the the definition of astro astrobiology, right? Which is the search for life's origin, evolution, distribution, and future in the universe. And it maps those four things: origin, evolution, distribution, and future to these RCNs and also the NASA Earth Sciences Division, which which we won't talk about today, but I'm sure David and, and Lindsay are happy to, to, to expand on. And so I I'll give a real brief overview of what the RCNs are. There's not a lot of um, stuff here, but the, the RCNs are us. They are a community collaboration network. We are organized, um, each of the RCNs is organized by the community around these themes where NASA really has coalescing research ideas. The leadership is composed of the co-leads. There's usually three to four for each RCN, as well as the steering committee. Uh, the steering committees are funded PIs from ROSES um, and the ICAR. Uh, that said, the membership, the affiliates, the people who are associated with each of these five RCNs is huge and really, really quite open. Um, I would I would say that all five RCNs have this really sort of open door policy. If you want to come play in any or all of the RCNs, you're certain, certainly welcome to, to do that. And so it's really this sort of open science concept that allows anybody who's interested in these fields to come and join the, the conversation. So the activities of the RCNs um, vary across all five of them. There are seminar series and workshops, um, early career mentoring and networking opportunities. There's um, proposals that get put together. Um, we, we spend a lot of um, time looking at mission development and mission targets, um, and we've Altogether, we've actually submitted we submitted quite a few decadal um, white papers to the last to the last decadal. So the last thing I'll I'll say, which isn't on here, and, and Lindsay can talk a little bit more about this, but the RCNs are not a, a funding source. Um, we are literally all of you. We are the community of scientists, and we're just trying to bring people together. So we don't really get money, and we don't really have money. <laughs> um, we are just people working together who are interested in these topics. And so it is really the, the groundest of the ground up kind of, kind of communities. That said, we're very integrated into the entire structure at NASA, both in planetary science and in astrobiology. This is, a, this is my last slide on the RCNs, but you can see how all of the RCNs here are really integrated to, to the missions at NASA. So 
That's my quick overview. I probably went too long because I was having trouble in the beginning. So I'm going to go speeding through now. Um, I think I'm the first RCN up. And so I will talk about PCE3, which is the Prebiotic Chemistry and Early Earth Environments Consortium. So what we are um, is a community of scientists striving to transform the origins of life community by breaking down language and ideological barriers, enhancing communication across disciplinary divide between early earth geoscientists and prebiotic chemists. What we really are interested in uh, scientifically is the to investigate the delivery, synthesis, and fate of small molecules under the conditions of the early earth and the subsequent formation of protobiological molecules and pathways um, that led to systems harboring for the, the potential for life. So one of them, the one at the top is the community aspect and the one at the bottom is sort of the umbrella of the science that we do. I want to recognize um, my other co-leads, Ram Krishnamurthy, Tim Lyons, and Lauren Williams. I think they're um, out there in the YouTube universe. Um, and we also have a number of volunteers that work with us from the steering committee, from the team members, and honestly, the community at large. We have a workshop organizing committee. We've had several now. We have um, our seminar series co-leads. We have early career advocacy. We have a communications team, a steering committee that I'll show you in just a minute and the Tipsy Organizing Committee, which is, which is a little teaser for one of my slides at the end. So this is our group of um, steering committee right now. So these are all PIs funded under Roses or ICAR. Um, they obviously come and go as people's awards sort of run out and new awards start up. And it, it makes for a really nice dynamic group of people. We get together um, and we talk about what this community of scientists needs um, and might want. And we try and pull ourselves together to, to um, put, put some of those activities into place. So we have one new um, ICAR. So we have a steering committee member, Scott Sanford, who just joined us. Scott couldn't be here today, but Michelle Nuevo is here um, to tell us a little bit about this ICAR effort um, at Ames Research Center. So um, if you're out there and can unmute, that would be great. And I'm just going to sit here and uh, leave my slides up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, um, so yes, we are not new into the astrobiology uh, effort because we've been part of the NAI for, for quite a long time, but this is a new proposal that was just uh, selected uh, through the ICAR pro program. And basically it's an, it's an interdisciplinary program that will combine this modeling, um, lab experiments and quantum chemistry computations. And the main purpose is to understand how organic molecules, in particular uh, organics, of astrobiology interest uh, made uh, during the formation of uh, planets in the in the in the dist, and so we want to investigate the dist conditions that lead to the origin of those molecules, how they are formed, where they are formed in the dist, and where they end up in the end in the in the planetary systems, and so. Uh, different, uh, do three different tasks, uh, do different things, but we compute uh, different parameters uh, for, for chemistry uh, that would be used in the lab and also in the DIS modeling. And uh, we compare uh, uh, DIS modeling um, predictions to, to actual uh, predictions of uh, observation uh, from uh, astronomical um, observations. And also uh, we do experiments in the lab. And one of the uh, things that we do also in the lab is to analyze uh, extraterrestrial samples to actually validate what we find in, 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 in our research. And we are uh, deeply involved in the OSIRIS-REx mission that will uh, come uh, deliver uh, samples that were um, collected on an asteroid uh, at the end of this month. And so we will be uh, firsthand to, to uh, to analyze the samples for the search uh, of organics. And we are currently also analyzing samples from another mission that went to collect uh, samples from another asteroid from the uh, Japanese uh, space agency, Hayabusa 2. And so um, we are we are trying to understand uh, the formation of those molecules from a very, very different perspective and try to, to get a whole story about how um, molecules of astrobiological interest um, were formed and how they connect to the origins of life. So that's our main goal. Thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate that. 
Um, so I'm gonna move really quickly forward through just a little bit of what PCE3 does um, broadly in science, and we sort of started to cover that here. Um, and, Sharon, and we're gonna I'll, ask you to wrap up in just one minute, if you could. One minute, okay. Yes, so, please, thank you. Fascinating. Um, so we do everything um, scientifically from planetary evolution through prebiotic complexity. So as you can imagine, most of what that takes is communication, right? And so I'm gonna skip over a few science slides and just really talk about what we do to bring the community together. And so we're always getting together at AppsIcon. We generally report to CAPS and PAC. We did submit a bunch of these white papers, but the really big ones are our seminar series, our newsletter, um, our special issue that's um, coming up, and our, and our workshops. So these are just a few of the um, decadal white papers and workshop reports. Um, that came through uh, recently. I wanted to introduce you to our communications team and our seminar series team that are listed here. Our seminar series has um, now been going on for two years with over 100 people showing up um, every three weeks when we have it. So it's really, it's really quite phenomenal when it comes to participation. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about um, is our community workshops. We've had three now. Our very first one was building a new foundation. We had it online in 2021. In 2022, we had um, the Nano to Cosmic Studies of Complex Systems. And what is coming next are our Tipsy workshops. I will tell you that we have our very own YouTube channel. Um, and just the videos from the very first community workshop has over 23,000 um, YouTube views. So I think you should check them out. A lot of people use them in their classes. So what's coming in this Tipsy idea is, um, is actually a mini symposium, a sort of a half day workshop is all we're gonna do. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick specific topics that people really need to get into the into the details of. And so here are, here are some of the topics that are coming down the line. I put this up there because these will all sort of be, or most of them will be done in conjunction with the other RCNs. And so um, that's, I'm gonna let them all tell you about what they're doing right now. And I just wanted to end with these last beautiful images um, that my colleague Jana Owasa put together in a review paper that we wrote with, um, with Justin Trail at University of Rochester. So I went a, about a minute over, but I think I ended mostly on time. I'm gonna stop this slideshow and try to stop sharing if I could figure <laughs> that out. We can, we, we have ways of stopping you sharing. Thanks, oh, Karen, very I much, appreciate it. Um, next up uh, will be Allison Murray, who's going to be talking. We can see you, Allison, although we don't see any slides yet. Um, who's going to be talking on behalf of the Network for Ocean Worlds or NOW? And we can see your skate, your your slides now, Allison. Um, although I will note you are on mute, um, so uh, when you <laughs> don't start talking until you take yourself off mute. <laughs> Thank you. I can hear you now. Thanks. Okay. And do you see the, are you seeing the right screen? Yep, that looks great. Okay, um, thanks Lindsay and Karen for doing a great introduction. Um, the Network for Ocean Worlds was established in 2019. And one of the things that um, I think as Karen was introducing the concepts between the RCNs, you know, NASA really created these to facilitate communication between the groups of researchers that it funds and um, and so uh, we have uh, a large team of co-leads in part because one of our charges was to really work between planetary sciences and the earth sciences division. So we um, have just gone through a, a rotation of some of our leads and we have two new ones, Jackie Grebmeyer and Dustin Schroeder, who um, are uh, coming and representing the earth sciences division um, of both uh, biological oceanography and cryosphere sciences. Uh, the goal of now overall is to accelerate ocean worlds research by facilitating communication among active research teams across NASA divisions and by expanding community-wide engagement. Um, we're uh, collectively interested in comparative oceanography between Earth's ocean and technologies used on Earth and uh, what we can learn about the ocean worlds and the solar system. The, um, the our sort of a profile of who is in now currently is we have about 102 members of the steering committee. Um, we have uh, those members of their 
their teams. Um, and then we have a large group of network affiliates of over 700 people. This is what Karen was referring to. We welcome anybody can join. We also have a, um, an early career group that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in another slide. Um, we uh, are a large group because a lot of different programs feed into uh, this um, the, the network and ocean world science from both technology and, and science ends, um, as well as Earth. Uh, the Earth Sciences Division. So if you are funded in one of these programs doing something related to ocean world science, you are welcome to opt in and c contact us if we haven't contacted you already. Um, you can also join as an affiliate, like I said, and you can do that at oceanworlds.space. Um, our newest uh, member of the um, steering committee and, and a team in our program um, was just recently selected in the ICAR program that Lindsay referred to. Um, and I've invited the lead of that um, project, Brent Christner, to just um, give you an introduction to what they're going to be working on. Brent, can you turn? Are you here? Yes. Can you hear me, Allison? Yeah. Uh, greetings, everyone, and I'm um, very pleased to have a little of your time to introduce a project we're very excited about uh, called Above and Below. We are a group of engineers, astrobiologists, microbiologists, synthetic biologists, and astrochemists that have a unified uh, interest in ocean world exploration and the expertise to study uh, the exotic conditions that exist on their surfaces. Now, as this community is aware, NASA is dedicating substantial resources for the search for life on ocean worlds and the possibility of a flagship mission that would go to one of these places and search for life, uh, be that something that lands on the surface or does that from orbit, would seem to be something that is more an issue of if, um, of when, not if. Any mission that's intending to detect biosignatures in these harsh environments needs to know how cells, cellular structures, informational molecules, and organic compounds are affected by the ice composition, the high radiation environment, and the low temperature and pressure. Uh, but currently, this is not something that we know a lot about. So to address this fundamental problem, the overarching objective of our project is to prove understanding of biosignature potential uh, to advise future efforts to plan to search for biosignatures on cryoices in ocean worlds. Ne next slide, please. So our pro proposed experimental approach is to examine biosignature preservation in cryoice compositions that range from defined mixtures, which allow us to identify the effects that individual impurities would have, to natural brines, to compositions which have actually been designed to simulate the ice compositions which have been inferred on Europa and Enceladus. And using the icy facility, which currently exists at uh, NASA Ames, we have the ability to do these experiments in situ into ice films that are no thicker than about two micron. So to simulate these experiments in much thicker ice columns, we'll be modifying an existing cryovac facility that is currently maintained by Stone Aerospace. And it'll be able to provide four different classes of ionizing radiation to the ice. And with this infrastructure, it allows us to carry out two types of tests, one which we've called Ice Lab, where we actually construct large blocks of ice and place them in the chamber and establish conditions. And another class of tests, which we are referring to as plume. And this, these are experiments where we are going to attempt to uh, simulate cryovolcanism by injecting micro droplets of materials into hard vacuum and very low temperature. Now, it's important to note that when all these, these capabilities are implemented, this is going to represent a cryovac facility that will be available to the community that's really unique from any other in existence, offering testing capabilities for any ocean world surface, as well as lunar and Mars um, regolith and ice experiments. Next slide, please. So in the case of Europa, it's one of the most extreme environments on the, in the solar system, and attempting to simulate uh, the highest radiation uh, energies that hit its surface are very challenging. 
So consequently, what we have done when we were developing this project is try to determine a relevant dose that could be delivered in a reasonable amount of time, and that would enable us to determine, to get quantitative results versus depth. So the compromise that we have selected is to do experiments over a range of dosages that extend up to about 10,000 gray. And that's shown in this graph by that yellow vertical line. And from this, we can, we can do these dosages probably in about nine hours. And from this, we, the idea will be to extrapolate to effects at larger doses. So in, in summary, the above and below project is going to generate the underlying data upon which any life detection strategy can be tested and evaluated, providing the type of quantitative information versus ice depth that will be essential for any astrobiological mission to an ocean world. Thank you. Well, thanks, Brent. Um, the, this that sort of spans a couple of the priority research themes that um, were really in, decided upon by the Research Coordination Network at our first kickoff meeting. Um, these include physical and chemical properties of ocean worlds, searching for evidence of life, uh, analog studies on Earth to inform ocean worlds research, and development of technologies for future ocean world missions. The um, network activities, I'm just going to go through uh, what we do um, kind of quickly here, uh, we um, are playing, we expand the membership and provide mentoring, we catalyze communications, we facilitate meetings, field trips and workshops, um, encourage public outreach and education and are pursuing new synergies uh, outside of our network. And I think um, this is important and something that, that David Kernspoon was mentioning in his uh, introduction too. Um, we are primarily a communications hub, and we um, these communications are available to everybody who's an affiliate member. Um, we have uh, from our website, we have monthly newsletters, uh, topics of um, field research programs or recent publications are submitted to us in our program called Making Waves. Uh, we have a jobs board, and we have a quarterly lecture series that's open to the public. Uh, that has, uh, we have one coming up on the 16th of October. Um, we are, um, we also serve a role as playing, as communicating with the scientific community, and um, that is both within our discipline as well as expanding out beyond our disciplines, as we did with this recent um, issue, special issue in oceanography. Um, we have an active um, early career group called the Future Leaders of Ocean Worlds, or FLOW. Um, they have uh, taken off on their own. They have their own leadership um, with the co-leads, Laura, Alta, and Miriam, shown here. Uh, they have activities. They, they come to our steering committee meetings. They have their own meetings on a monthly basis. Um, we are participating with them in uh, collaborative coffee hours, which we're going to restart up this fall. Um, they participated in a recent retreat that I'll tell you about, and uh, they are taking the lead on our inclusion, diversity, and equity uh, and access committee, as as well as holding a uh, discussion sessions this fall on mentoring best practices. Uh, as the activities that we we participated in or are participating in were. Um, really excited about this new Ocean Worlds working group that is collaborative between OPAG and SBAG, um, which is developing a cohesive strategy for Ocean Worlds exploration. This has just started up uh, late earlier this summer. Um, we, uh, as part of the network activities, we have facilitated different types of proposal development activities to, to bring teams together, um, and also have uh, been participating at the sort of pan uh, RCN level to, to discuss the future of um, astrobiology. Uh, we have, are just coming off of a retreat that we held a couple of weeks ago. Um, we had 51 people um, that, uh, including steering committee members, team and their team members, as well as people from Flow, which comprised about 40% of the group. Um, we went out to the Wrigley Marine Science Center at Catalina Island, and in this isolated uh, 
place we're able to really um, be present and delve into um, ocean worlds topics really with the intent to bridge between uh, the earth-based ocean science and planetary ocean, or, uh, planetary ocean science research and technologies. Um, major goal here was to foster community building, um, build future collaboration opportunities, and, and encourage the participation, really and involve the participation of early career in this. Um, we identified synergies and technology development that are mission related on both both Earth mission and planetary missions. And um, we're planning on producing an Ocean Worlds field guide that will be a living resource for the community um, to really help the communication between these different fields, um, because this really spans uh, a lot of uh, a lot of science. Um, we had thematic modules Just, and it was a pretty. Allison, one more minute, if you're if we okay. can. Thanks. Um, we had uh, a pretty intense week and schedule. We covered a lot of topics um, and we offered, we had a practical experience learning about oceanographic sampling, ROV operations, um, different kinds of technologies using ocean optics, um, as well as uh, we met with different programs considering future research opportunities. And I think it was very successful. It was an interesting week. We were out there when the uh, tropical storm hit Southern California, um, but it really came out, I think, as a, a great success. Um, and I'll just go through this. We, as a part of the community, we have identified high priority needs in really accessing um, relevant, um, both laboratories and maybe Brent's ICAR will help access this, but for laboratory, but also field places where researchers can test and do research with instrument technologies. Um, that will be the topic of a workshop hopefully this fall. Um, we have, um, we'll be developing this field guide. We have special session at the Ocean Sciences meeting, which we're accepting abstracts and um, hopefully planning future meetings for Ocean Worlds 5 and maybe through a Gordon Research Conference format. So thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, next, we have Brooke, who is presenting on behalf of the Network for Life Detection, or NFOLD. Uh, Brooke, take it away, and I will, I'm going to break in and give you a one-minute uh, uh, notification. Thanks. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so, yes, I'm part of Network for Life Detection, or Infold, as we call it. Um, it's led by myself, Alfonso, and Heather. Um, and then Bradley runs the administrative aspects to keep the network running at a fast pace that we're trying to achieve. Um, we have a total of 40, 47 steering committee members currently, five special mission-focused members, and 76 early career members. Now, as a reminder, um, after we heard a lot about this at the very beginning of the town hall, but the decadal strategy specifically asks the question, is there evidence of past or present life in the solar system beyond Earth, and how do we detect it? So Enfold's goal is to help inform life detection strategies for upcoming missions. Now, we bring researchers together with engineers and technologists to specifically improve uh, performance and add robustness to the life detection technology and research fields. So Enfold can provide the life detection expertise to a, a wide range of people to frame science questions, set expectations for data collection, inform instrument design, and build cohesive strategies for future missions. And we generically do this by building a community that will first and foremost promote discourse relevant to life detection. Specifically, we try to encourage debate between engineers and research scientists. We have forum-style talks. Um, on the research and technology within the steering committee. Um, and those act as, in general, when we have these forum style talks, we also have other talks that are called think tanks, which um, allow us to provide basically expert level feedback on such things um, to analysis groups like uh, MEPAG or OPAG. Graham, our lead for NCOT team, also provides lots of the uh, communication um, aspects, or he's the lead of the NCOT team. Um, and he does this through newsletters, blogs, social media communications. And you'll see throughout my talk, I'm providing a variety of um, QR codes so that you can get more information if you're interested. Now, to bring up the next generation of life detection scientists and technology um, experts, we have a very active career, um, early career council. Um, the ECC is currently led by Bonnie Light. And uh, as I mentioned, we have 76 members. So their presence actually really boosts our steering committee events 
Um, soon they'll be leading their own think tank in October, uh, where they'll be presenting uh, their own research. And in general, the ECC team manages lots of our communication and social science events. Um, for example, they offer up a monthly shut up and write event uh, on Zoom where members can log in. And this increases collaborations within the, the group um, itself and um, across the different astrobiology fields. And I think it also boosts their publication rates. Um, they offer workshops and life detection Q&A sessions too. Now, as I mentioned, we offer think tanks and forums that people are welcome to watch. Um, these are open collaborative discussions that identify benefits and challenges and limitations to life detection missions. Um, and we discuss topics relevant to, to missions that are and all the research that's been conducted by the SC members and their teams. Format's a little unusual in that we open it to public presentations. Um, these are live streamed and recorded, and you can see all these now if you, or you're interested. They're all on our website. And then we close the doors to have a steering committee discussion. And this is to really encourage direct feedback, brainstorming, and networking. So the goal for these meetings is to um, really emphasize debate um, and get discussions to be lively so we can figure out what needs to happen for us to move forward in life detection strategies. So our 2023 uh, series was focused on ocean world analogs and life detection tech. Um, where our first talk was on peptides as life detection biomarkers and their analysis on mission suitable orbit trap mass specs. That was followed by Enceladus ice grains and Orylander tech. And we had Astrobiology of Ocean Worlds. These are a great series of talks, by the way. Um, I highly encourage you to go look at them. Um, then we looked at the latest breakthroughs in nanopore and nano gap technology, lipid biosignatures and mass spectrometry detection. Um, and then last, we had. Um, a talk on mission readiness and breakthroughs on microscopy for life detection. And again, as I mentioned, all of these are recorded on webcast. Now, if you watch them all, you'll see that there are seven, several common scientific threads or outcomes from these discussions. First off, organic chemistry is a key focus for life detection in ocean worlds. That transition from non-life to life encompasses a spectrum of abiotic, prebiotic, and biotic with kind of ill-defined boundaries, right? So if we don't know what life is or where it begins, how do we know what to look for? So we're arguing that these analyses should include um, molecular level building blocks all the way to complex biosignatures. There are uh, significant developments being made in um, a variety of biomarkers that can demonstrate they can provide environmental context within the actual chemical composition. And then molecular complexity index has been a very high topic of discussion um, as a potential promising method for agnostic life detection, but does need further validation. So we're encouraging that. There are a range of life detection technologies that conduct ultra-sensitive organic chemical analyses remotely and on other planets. Um, I've listed a few. Again, these are some that we brought up in our talks. And these technologies can target specific compounds or can conduct broad chemical surveys. Um, and look for multiple clues that might reveal origin or biotic or abiotic aspects. Some of the technology gaps we've noticed um, as we've done these discussions, sample acquisition and handling is a concern. There's a need um, that's been focused on, a need is focused development of technology for large volume sample prep for concentrating organic molecules and cell cells. Um, specifically, we see a gap in the reduction of milliliter volumes to microliter volumes for analyses for, for specific instrumentation. And we also see that there's a need for platforms that share these samples between instruments. Now, if you disagree with any of those, um, we encourage you to attend um, any of these talks that we're giving and, and give us your feedback. So, Infold also runs a variety of workshops. Um, the first one I'm presenting here is we ran a standard of evidence for life detection workshop in 2021, I believe. Um, this was a collaboration with Nexus and Enfold. Workshop was in response to a paper calling for a framework for reporting evidence for life beyond Earth. And it builds off the criteria from the ladder of life detection, specifically introducing a framework to evaluate any putative biosignature. And it uses five questions that cover biosignature detection, biosignature context, and assessment. And the goal of the workshop, again, was to assess and challenge this framework that they built with a range of examples. And if you're interested in this um, and, and the progress that's going on with the standards of life detections, or sorry, standards of evidence for life detection, there's um, a QR code here for the white paper that's in, um, archived. 
and the CAP subsequent review of the standards of evidence framework. Then in 2023, in collaboration with the Network for Ocean Worlds, um, we ran the Ocean World Analog Field Site Workshop. Um, and the goal there was to standardize criteria for field site fidelity and help investigators identify high fidelity ocean and world and analog environments. Specifically, they were interested in building a comprehensive framework that addresses five key questions that I put over here. But also we're interested in making sure we're, we have uh, standards for protecting sites and promoting sustainable field work in the future. And last, one of the primary goals was to build partnerships between institutions and investigators for future field work. Proposed a narrative approach and a matrix approach that provides standardized equitable tools to assess and defend the fidelity of ocean world analog field sites. And it was brought to my attention, in general, the, uh, the classification and the series of both na the narrative approach and the matrix approach are applicable to any field site selection. One of the other outcomes of that workshop has to increase the diversity, inclusivity, and the equitability of astrobiology field, um, field research. We generated an interactive map, and it's available on our website that will help you make connections for new investigators who, um, who are looking at doing future field work. In 2021, um, Just, we I know, worked- One more minute, Brooke. Great. Right, uh, we brought together Enfold and Nexus to build a simulated mission to detect life on a new ocean world. Um, this was at the University of Washington. Um, they got to design their own mission and run their own experiments and analyze over a total of 90 data sets, which was concluded in a, a live three-hour debate. And I wanted to point this out because it was a beautiful collaboration that brought together over 30 astrobiology experts from many of the research coordination networks you're hearing from today. Last, our team generates public accessible research highlights on the latest findings in life detection tech. Um, this one is from Alan Hill's meteorite that was showcased by the program officers at NASA headquarters um, when they presented their progress report for astrobiology. And we make these um, every month and they're easily accessible on our website. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, next up is going to be uh, Rob Zellum presenting for Nexus, but I am going to give a quick reminder that we have an upcoming Q&A period if folks have questions. Uh, so make sure to get them in the chat and we will answer what we can in the meantime. Uh, finally, I will thank Brooke for her great presentation on behalf of Enfold and invite Rob to start sharing his slides um, and, we will, uh, and we will hear about Nexus. And can you see the slide okay? Yes, we can. Cool. Thank you for having me, everyone. I'm Rob. I'm presenting today on behalf of our new Nexus co-leads, um, over Colin, uh, Hillary Hartnett, Jessica Noviello, Linda Soul, and myself. Um, we're all new here, except uh, Jessica has been an excellent sort of common thread that's been guiding us new co-leads on how to run Nexus and how to uh, prepare for the next few years. So uh, Nexus stands for NASA's Nexus for Exoplanet System Science. And what we're ultimately doing here is we're working together to find life in the universe. So uh, Nexus goals are can only really be achieved by interdisciplinarity. So we're aiming here to bring together planetary science, earth sciences, heliophysics, and astrophysics to help us study planetary habitability and the search for life on exoplanets in order to answer these fundamental questions related to planet formation, evolution, diversity, habitability, and signs of life. And membership is open to any scientist working on Nexus science areas. We encourage you to join. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Nexus is really working to help bring these communities together to uh, foster communication folks working together. Um, so, for example, we're building community and advances our science in workshops and conferences such as Hab Worlds, Biosignatures, Technoclimbs. Uh, we're collaborative exoplanet observing communities. So, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope early release science uh, proposals came out now naturally out of uh, Nexus and all of the work that they've been doing there. Um, the science working groups, we have intermodel comparisons, habitability quantification, techno signatures, and science communications. And we have a quarterly steering committee or PI meetings. We have a Slack workspace, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. We have uh, working groups, early career channels. So it's really easy to stay in touch with folks and to help communicate via our Slack workspace. We also have uh, newsletters, website, uh, publication bulletins, and email lists as well. 
So I want to run through our new ICAR groups here. Uh, the first up I'll be talking about is the CHAMPS team, which is led by Kevin Stevenson at Johns Hopkins APL, and the science PI is Ravi Kaparalaru at uh, Goddard. And ultimately what they'll be doing here is they're aiming to answer the overall arching science question of can and dwarf planets support life? And if so, how do we best observe and characterize them? And by uh, to answer this question, they'll be focusing on four core tasks here. They'll be looking at planetary processes of M-dwarfs, uh, planetary atmospheres, star planet interactions, and exoplanet observations. And all their deliverables are uh, from one task, such as task one, are then used as inputs to the next. And they're looking forward to James Webb observations that will also yield quantitative constraints that feed back into their models. Uh, the next group is led by Michael Way out of Goddard as well, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And uh, this is Habitability Space, which is exploring a new frontier via climate models and planetary statistics. And they've broken up their study into three themes. The first theme here at the top right is going to be studying Venus, Earth, and Mars through time with global circulation models to determine how habitability is imprinted on planetary spectra. Their next theme is then exploring habitability across a range of orbital parameters, such as orbital eccentricity or obliquity. And then their third theme is that all their models and the results will be publicly accessible for comparison with uh, future and uh, current observations. So it'll be a nice community resource for folks to use if they get observations on James Webb, they can compare that to all the work that's been done by this group. Our next group is the uh, Virtual Planetary Laboratory led by Vicki Meadows at University of Washington. Uh, and what VPL is focusing on doing is searching for life on exoplanets by first creating a network of networks of five RCNs to identify novel biosignatures in the context of early Earth environments. Then they'll be understanding the environmental context and develop statistical frameworks to interpret uh, biosignatures. They'll be then uh, obtaining James Webb observations and simulating observations as well of planetary systems to help detect these uh, terrestrial planetary characteristics. And then lastly, they'll be using simulations and frameworks developed uh, in the identity and the interpretation and the detection tasks to assess how well we can discriminate between a non-living solar neighborhood or uh, a non-living solar neighborhood, looking forward mostly to Habitable Worlds Observatory. And our next group here is led by PI Dave Green at CU Boulder, which is the retention of habitable X atmospheres and planetary systems. And they're looking to answer the overall dream question of how do the properties of a planet and its host star influence its ability to retain an atmosphere. And they have these four overall objectives here. The first one is to compute inputs for atmospheric escape and uh, for an ensemble of star planet scenarios. So looking at stellar UV, for example, their next objective is improving and linking the models for atmosphere escape from any planets. Uh, then their third objective is to construct a multi-dimensional model library for atmospheric escape, and this will all be hosted on a public web interface um, for folks to use. And then lastly, it'll be applying this model library to understand the connection between atmospheric escape, habitability, and observations as well. As I mentioned in the very beginning of this talk, we have a, a fun, bunch of future plans and upcoming events as well, Habitable Worlds free workshop will be happening. Uh, the date is to be determined, but we're seeking leadership committee members now. And one way to get in touch with us about us is through our website or our Slack channel. Uh, there'll be a really strong Nexus presence at the Venus workshops in Albuquerque, New Mexico in late October. Uh, we'll be restarting our webinar web series as well, which will be uh, publicly accessible to the entire community to call on and learn about various parts of Nexus and hear from some of our working groups. And if you're interested in helping out of that, just uh, send me a Slack message on our Slack workspace. Um, we also went under a recent programmatic review, review in early 2023. We're now assessing this and incorporating some of the recommendations. Uh, we're hoping for more interdisciplinary involvement, particularly from the Helios Physics Division. So if you're interested, please do sign up. And we're working on developing a new grand challenge to catalyze the broad community collaboration across the whole data model divide for exoplanets to make sure that uh, data is helping um, suss out any issues that are in models and using models as well to help it in or interpret our data from telescopes such as James Webb. 
I wanted to give also a quick shout out to pause our professional advancement workshop series, which has been led by Jessica. She's been doing an excellent job of uh, establishing and running this group for early career researchers to explore different career paths and hone new skills. So this provides early career folks the space to network and learn together. This is ostensibly open to all members of the RCNs within the NASA Astrobiology Program. But if you're interested in participating, uh, send Jessica a message and she can tell you if you are able to join or not. Um, these are fully virtual. They're monthly meetings. There's a monthly, or there's a workshop coming up in January 2024, and you can find more information about PAUSE here on their website. You can also scan this QR code as well, and it's also linked from the main Nexus website as well. Uh, Soon, uh, we just wanted to also give this quick update on our change of leadership. I just want to say a quick shout out, thanks to all the HQ reps and the NASA, uh, the, the co-leads that have been uh, establishing Nexus and making it amazing. Really appreciate all the foundation they've been laying and all the excellent work they've been doing. Uh, and here are the new HQ reps and co-leads. And a uh, big also shout out as well to not only the former co-leads who have been extremely helpful in helping us figure out what to do, but also Jessica Noviello as well. She's been a huge help. So lastly, I wanted to leave you with this last slide on how to get involved in Nexus. You can become a member of a relevant accepted NASA proposal. You can participate in our workshops, our conferences, and other community activities. Or lastly, you can join as a Nexus affiliate there on that uh, URL, or you can scan that QR code that we've left right there. So thank you so much for your time and really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Rob, appreciate it. Uh, finally up, we will have Frank and Ariel to talk with us about the RCN life. There's Frank, Ariel, are you on as well? And there you guys are. The floor is yours, gentlemen. All right, folks, can you see my uh, screen, I hope, and hopefully you can hear me as well. Uh, we are the, the last, last up, and we were the last to launch. Uh, the Life RCN uh, launched at ABSICON uh, 2022, and then we formed our steering committee and really got rolling uh, last fall. So in a sense, this is kind of an annual uh, report for us. Uh, who are we? Well, we're a growing community dedicated to understanding life, planet, coevolution, uh, recorded in a number of different uh, uh, places in the rocks, in genome databases, in extant biodiversity, as well as modeled in silico or through lab proxy studies. We are a community that wishes to develop a science of living worlds by looking at life, planet, coevolution, and asking questions like what environmental pressures, mechanisms, evolutionary opportunities first gave rise to cellular life, caused life to expand to a planetary scale, uh, led to eukaryogenesis, and favored the transition to multicellularity. Our goals are to understand how major biological innovations uh, shape the evolutionary trajectory of this life planet uh, system, and to discern the rules of life planet coevolution so as to predict how life could evolve on other worlds and inform our search for it. Who are we? Uh, our, the co-leads are myself and Ariel, Mary Drozer, and Betul Kachar, um, with Becky as our point of contact. This is our growing uh, steering committee of uh, exobiology uh, researchers. And we have an uh, active early career investigator committee consisting of these individuals who've played uh, an important role in getting our seminar series going and will play important roles in our upcoming workshop that we'll tell you about momentarily. So what are we doing to reach our goals? Well, our charter said that we were going to try to bring together uh, a, a large community, paleontologists, geobiologists, molecular biologists, evolutionary biologists, uh, as well as welcoming people who are theoreticians, uh, as well as experimentalists uh, investigating evolution of catalysts, pathways, networks, compartments across scale, uh, from macromolecules to ecosystems. 
And so uh, we're uh, involved in outreach. Uh, we have had a presence at AbGradCon uh, 23. We are uh, putting in special proposals for AbSciCon 2024. And importantly, the life membership uh, has leaders uh, in the Gordon Research Conference Circuit, uh, Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution, and AGU. In addition, uh, at our respective institutions, we're uh, organizing relevant local uh, symposia. So, for example, at my institution, Georgia Tech, uh, a big deal on our campus, the Suttoth Symposium, and uh, this uh, 2024 topic is on the evolution of multicellularity and cellular differentiation being co-organized by Will Ratcliffe, who many of you know, and myself. As I noted, uh, our early career folks have really spearheaded efforts to get our speaker series off and running. And these are live streamed first Monday of every month, uh, 30 or 40 minute talks followed by moderated Q&A. And we kicked off this summer uh, with Maria Gomez uh, from UC Irvine, a great talk on microbial communities, followed by Paula, who uh, educated us on Archaea, and we have an exciting lineup coming up for this uh, this coming fall. Uh, Steve, uh, Patricia, Galen, and Chen Mai, and the last um, uh, individual from Ames, uh, whose field is instrument development, space biology, represents a, an, an, um, an effort by the early career folks to bring people involved in mission development to speak to this uh, group of largely evolutionary biologists. So the next seminar up is uh, that of uh, Steve Vance at JPL, Geophysical Investigations of Habitability and Icy Ocean Worlds. We encourage you to uh, join us uh, for this uh, here in just a few days. Other goals. I'm going to turn this over to my colleague uh, Ariel Anbar now uh, because uh, Ariel and Betul have spearheaded the fall virtual uh, workshop, Nitrogen Cycling Across Planetary Scales. Ariel. Great. Everyone can hear me. Uh, so this is the time. Uh, among the things we're very interested in in this RCN is the uh, selection of health components by life and how that changes over evolutionary time and how that shapes evolution. Uh, so I'm talking about this, we identified that there's people interested right now in nitrogen cycles. So we are organizing a virtual workshop, nitrogen cycling across planetary scales. It's going to be two mornings, October 18th and 20th. Uh, there'll be words circulated about this any day now by Figura and, and others. So you can see this here in uh, you know, some various ways soon. Uh, ben Johnson at Iowa State and Eva Stuykin at uh, St. Andrews are, are really spearheading this. The tool and I are, are helping catalyze um, in true uh, uh, nitrogen cycle spirit. We're catalysts. Um, and the basic spirit of this is that, uh, as it says here in the synopsis, uh, life requires nitrogen. Um, there's been a lot of evolution recently in our understanding of nitrogen cycling on Earth. Um, how does that inform, how should it inform future uh, astrobiology missions, um, future astrobiology exploration? Um, that's what this workshop is really all about. So it's going to bring together people who understand the Earth side, the life side, as well as planetary exploration. Um, and the goal is to develop a bit of a white paper on what are the key questions uh, that the future research should focus on around nitrogen cycling as it relates to astrobiology exploration. Um, Frank, you want me to just pick up the next slide here? Sure. Uh, so uh, we're going to close out here just by talking about a couple of, um, of ICARs that are now affiliated with this RCN. So one of them is... Uh, the MUSE ICAR, Metal Utilization and Selection Across Eons. Batool is the PI, I have the deputy PI. Um, you can see here this other, uh, this list of other illustrious folks who are part of our co-investigators in this project. Um, and next slide. Broadly, this project is about understanding, uh, you can think about it, really like jumping about it as the, the rules of element selection in life. Why does life choose what it chooses in terms of elements? Uh, to what extent it doesn't have to do with the availability of the chemical elements through time versus the particular um, uh, uh, chemical properties of chemical elements. Both of those are important. And the interplay between that is, is interesting but poorly understood. We focus in particular on the nitrogen cycle, but not, not exclusively. Um, and uh, so we, we bring together that brings together 
uh, geoscientists and life scientists to try to understand the interplay between geochemical availability and biochemical need and chemical function uh, and how that shapes the evolution of, of in particular metal use uh, in, in key enzymes like nitrogenase for the nitrogen cycle. Uh, next slide. Uh, the I card has already been somewhat productive. Uh, as you might imagine, so we're interested in metal use over time. We're interested in, that means we're interested in oxygen over time because that affects the availability of key transition metals, especially our, our hobby course in aluminum, which is important for nitrogen fixation and the nitrogen cycle. Um, so we've had some recent work um, around uh, you know, reassessing um, uh, the rise of oxygen uh, in earlier history and its effect on aluminum availability in the oceans. A uh, really cool paper by Evans et al. here that uh, establishes that hydrothermal systems, which heretofore had not been thought of as a major source of molybdenum in the oceans, which they aren't today, probably were a major source, or at least a non-trivial source, in Archean oceans uh, in a sort of more, much more anoxic world. And then a variety of papers here, um, we hear Garcia, Peng, and, and Kezior et al. Are, are just three of a, of a slew of papers coming up in particular from Bay Tools Group. Um, that are looking at ancient proteins and doing various other things to, to try to understand uh, evolution of these metabolisms. In the interest of time, I won't go into any detail on any of those. Which is back to Frank. Great. So again, what are we doing to reach our goals in terms of research? Um, uh, we have one uh, ICAR associated, a new ICAR selection associated with this group. Um, and we've invited uh, the, the PI, <laughs> namely myself, to tell you a little bit about this. It's entitled Engine of Innovation, How Compartmentalization Drives Evolution of Novelty and Efficiency Across Scales. Really excited about this team that includes um, uh, Jeff Shelley, um, uh, uh, Joshua, Chris, John, Victoria, Alexis, and Boz from Boulder, and um, and Blue Marble, Santa Fe, ASU, and Caltech. So a turning point in life's history occurred when populations of self-replicating molecules crossed the Darwinian threshold to cellularity. And so the hallmark of this transition was enclosing a self-replicating molecular system within uh, a boundary. And so once enclosed like this, the living world began to diversify, driven by biochemical and morphological innovation within compartments. So compartmentalization is a principle by which living systems are organized today, whether that means co-localizing proteins and small molecules in separate phases or dividing labor uh, within and among cells. So we define a compartment as a structure in which exchange of components with the surrounding milieu is restricted, often but not always by membrane or protein uh, shell. And we hypothesize that this compartmentalization increases flexibility and or efficiency in acquiring, processing, and serving resources across scales from the molecular to the ecological. So we're going to be uh, uh, investigating uh, increase uh, compartmentalization's uh, architecture, increasing in complexity from prebiotic uh, aggregation, as seen in number one. So Alexis is involved in this. Sequestration of problematic metabolites, number two. Encapsulation of enzymes and bacterial microcompartments, number three. Nested metabolic compartments, number four and serial endosymbioses, number five, and microbial consortia, either in the laboratory or in nature, uh, number six. And then, uh, obviously, this will uh, produce uh, experimental data sets from a range of abiotic and biological systems that display distinct compartmentalization mechanisms. And Jeff and Chris will be using tools from statistical physics, metabolic modeling, ecological theory, and population genetics to quantify the benefits and the costs associated with compartmentalization and provide a common theoretical framework for this cross-theme uh, comparison. So- um, Last minute, Frank. Yes, and I'm going to finish on time. So uh, just to remind you that we have this online community seminar series and that we have uh, workshops. We invite you to these. Uh, everyone in the community is welcome and encouraged to join in. If you're interested in being on the steering committee and have uh, NASA funding, please contact us. 
And circling back to uh, Karen's last slide, just to emphasize that we are part of a network of networks that supports the, the overall NASA um, mission. And we have our uh, looking forward to connections with Nexus and NOW, and I think already have connections with Enfold and PCE3. And uh, with that, I will just say uh, I thank all my other RCN co-leads uh, for their uh, contributions uh, today um, and look forward to the question and answer. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank and Ariel. Appreciate it. Um, and I love that you wrapped us back back around to the start. It's a great way to uh, to show all the connectivity. So thank you very much. Um, we are going to uh, do a little bit of a question and answer section now. Um, so Daniela, if you have any questions, um, and we'll call the particular if we if we have if we need a particular RCN lead, um, we'll call your names out to answer those questions. So uh, Daniela, what do you what do you have for us on the questions? Okay, we've got a few questions that have come in. And the first one, I think we're going to ask Linda Billings to say a few words, but all of you as well, please. Are there any policy-related workshops from astrobiology point of view? The short answer is no. The longer answer is there are many different places uh, to, to look for um, policy guidance or policy recommendations. Of course, the White House and Congress provide NASA with policy, policy uh, directions. Um, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine has a Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Sciences. Their meetings are public, and they're almost always webcast. Uh, I belong to a group of scholars called the Society for Social and Conceptual Issues in Astrobiology. We meet every other year. Um, we're a group, I'm a social scientist myself. Um, we have many philosophers and ethicists and some astrobiologists. Uh, participating in SOCIA, as we call it, and our next meeting will be in Finland next year. But no, no, no specific um, astrobiology policy related workshops that I know of. Thank you very okay. much, Linda. Thanks. Did you, um, David or Lindsay, want to add anything? Actually, I'll jump in really quickly to say that um, if I can put in another plug for the Bloomberg program at the Library of Congress, yes. um, there have been a lot of activities related um, to astrobiology and uh, larger questions of the humanities um, in terms of uh, theology and history and ethics and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, none that specifically have um, been about policy, but a lot they're sort of policy adjacent. And and if you go to the uh, the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress, the the website for the scholarly wing of the Library of Congress, um, you can find a lot online. All the past um, symposia and seminars are um, are captured and recorded there. And as well, uh, I just another plug that um, you know there are open applications if anybody's interested in applying to be um, an astrobiology chair in the future. It's really a good opportunity to explore the intersections of astrobiology with other areas, including policy. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we have another question about the uh, pertaining to the RCNs. Does Enfold have a seminar series like PCE3 and LIFE have? Hi, um, I can answer that. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we do. And it's on our website. We post it in our newsletter as to when they're being offered. But we honestly respond to, um, we don't, we don't pre-plan our entire year. We have a seminar series. We listen to the discussion. And then whatever comes out of the discussion is how we navigate the next one that we're going to pitch. So you have to follow the, the newsletter, which you're welcome to su subscribe to. Fantastic. Thank you so Thank much, you. Brooke. Um, and I'll note, um, I believe that the website for all of the RCNs um, have been shared in the chat. If that's if, if any of them uh, piqued your curiosity or your interest while you were listening to the presentation, you can either find those websites in the chat or you can go to astrobiology.nasa.gov. Um, and there are links there to all of the RCN websites where you can sort of continue your journey and look for, for more information. Um, I know that we have a couple questions that are still sitting in the chat, but in the interest of trying to keep us a little bit closer on time, 
time. I'm going to suggest that we take our five minute break now. We have one more 15 minute question and answer period at the end of the of the whole town hall. Um, and so I uh, want to make sure that we have an opportunity to chat with our Mars folks uh, while you know close enough to the time that we ask them to come and chat with us. Uh, so let's do a five minute break um, and we'll, we will be back in just a few uh, to hear about the Mars Future Plan as well as uh, the International Mars Ice Mapper. Thanks, folks.
Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you uh, sticking around. And we have some really interesting presentations now. Um, the first off will be Tiffany Morgan, who will be presenting on the Mars Future Plan. Tiffany? Good afternoon. I am going to share my screen now. Can folks see that? Looking great. Thank you. OK, so good afternoon. I am Tiffany Morgan, Deputy Director for the Mars Exploration Program. And I'm going to tell you about the Mars Exploration Program's future plan, which is exploring Mars together. And that's a draft plan for sustainable future uh, for, the sci for science at Mars 2023 to 2043. Uh, you'll see a handful of names over here on the right hand side of the screen. These are co-leads that have put together uh, this amazing future plan. There have been many other people that have contributed as well, but these are the, the primary folks from uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as well as the Science Mission Director at NASA Headquarters team. There we go. Okay, so just a, a quick recap reminder of Mars Exploration Program and everything that we've been doing for the last two decades or so. This is the Mars fleet chart, and what you'll see represented here are both U.S. missions as well as other international missions. The, the NASA missions are the, I guess it's a light blue color. Across the top, you can see many orbiters. The last orbiter that NASA launched was MAVEN in 2013 under the SCOUT program. And then over the last 20 years or so, we've had, uh, NASA has put um, down four rovers and two landers, with Mars Perseverance being the last one. Moving forward, you'll see the sample retrieval lander as well as the Earth return orbiter. And between those three elements uh, on Mars, those make up the Mars sample return campaign in addition to the sample receiving project that we will have uh, for a facility on Earth. Additionally, we'll be working with ESA on their Rosalind Franklin mission, which is looking for life, present life as well. Along the bottom of the chart, you can see the themes that we've had over the last um, 20 years. Follow the water, found the water, explore habitability, determine Jezero was the best place to look for um, signs of ancient life. And then through all of this, we have been preparing for the future human uh, explorers. Okay, so on to a little bit of background and the introduction to our Exploring Mars Together plan. As I mentioned, we've had two decades of very successful uh, missions to Mars, orbiters, landers, rovers, and collaborations with international partners. But what we haven't done in recent years is address critical aging infrastructure at Mars. So as I said before, MAVEN was the last orbiter that we have launched, and that is those orbiters are critical to us for science, imaging, and communications. So we need to ensure that we're addressing the infrastructure at Mars that we've become so dependent upon. Most of the missions on Mars are well into their extended missions, Perseverance being obviously the newest one, and it is also into an, its extended mission past the, the prime mission, um, you know, from a, a science gathering instruments on board, not in terms of the Mars sample return campaign. But Everything has, has performed successfully and are now into their extended missions. I've already mentioned that we're preparing for human presence at Mars. And with this, this future plan, one thing that has changed for us uh, quite significantly and just amazingly awesomely is uh, all the additional agencies and partners that we might have available to pursue science on Mars with us. So there's much more international participation than there was the last time we put together strategy and a lot more commercial interest as well as a lot more commercial capability. So we want to uh, account for all this, this changing environment and this new paradigm for our future plan. Additionally, we have Mars Sample Return. Mars Sample Return has been cited as the most important, um, you know, Mars uh, science for the last past three decades or over the last two decades. Critical chapter for everything that's going on on Mars to return those samples, analyze those samples, learn from those samples, evolve the science that we want from those samples. But at the same time, we want to be able to, like I said before, address our, our infrastructure as well as have some other science. Uh, orbiters and 
and uh, surface access uh, for science. So this future plan is uh, over the next two decades, and we want you know a whole bunch more data while we're doing Mars sample return, and we want to incorporate our, our partners internationally, commercially, and and then across all of the science communities. So what we've done or what we've started with, because we did take a lot of inputs, I would say over the last three or four years from many different organizations, um, we've had SAGs, uh, we had a, a, a KISS workshop, we've had um, industry days, we've worked with a uh, measurement de development team. You'll hear from IMIM later that that measurement development team really, um, or measurement definition team really helped us inform a lot of the things that went into this. So we've really focused on a lot of those inputs in the last year or so, but we broadly looked uh, greater across like the last three or four years. And we had a SAG that said, um, you know, what, what, what science should we focus on within our MEPAG science goals for low cost? And what can we do in the next couple of decades? And so we came up the SAG recommended and, and the team uh, assessed and, and is proceeding with these three co-equal program science themes. One, explore the, the potential for Martian life, support human exploration of Mars, and discover dynamic Mars. And discover dynamic Mars is, to me, a little bit more network science or system science, looking at things across the globe a little bit more holistically. But I think of the most interest probably for this audience is explore the potential for Mar Martian life. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here. So within this, this science theme, we have three primary goals. One is searching for biosignatures past and present, understanding temporal and geographic patterns of habitability, and examining the, example, examining the samples from MSR to understand Martian geological biological processes. If you're familiar with the decadal, one of the things that the decadal called out uh, is the, the Mars Life Explorer, or EMILY. And we've generically taken that um, concept and called it Search for Life. And this is something that we've incorporated into the future plan. And one thing that's up and coming is a joint search for life SAG between astrobiology and Mars communities to help us identify where we might want to go on Mars to search for life, and then what technology we would need to develop or to evolve to search for life in those areas. So that is a, a, a key tenant of what we're doing in exploring the potential for Martian life, as well as um, you know, knowledge-driven, uh, discovery-driven uh, science that we we gain from the samples, the knowledge that we get from um, those Mars sample return um, assessments and, and analysis. And then uh, I don't want to leave out physical access to the subsurface. We're also looking at drills. Uh, I think that that search for life SAG will also help us identify if if subsurface is where we want to go and and what we need to do in those areas. So what we've done to make sure that we can uh, accomplish this science is we've put together four different initiatives as, as the framework or the foundation for this future plan. The first one is to expand opportunities to explore Mars through competed lower cost, more frequent flight opportunities. So low cost is is uh, an area that we want to explore and make sure that we have opportunities there. And that really helps the system science, but there's also some medium cost. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Strengthening and broadening the infrastructure. In, in order for us to enable the low cost missions, we need to make sure that there's infrastructure there to support those missions so that the missions themselves don't have to bear the brunt of incorporating the infrastructure. Also key technologies, uh, we wanna really, um, beef up the, the technology program we have within Mars Exploration Program for future future missions. And then, of course, um, last but not least, is, is the people. And we want to enable participation in Mars Exploration for all communities. So a little bit more about each of those initiatives. OK, so uh, mentioned the lower cost, more frequent flight opportunities. We'd really love to be able to take advantage of you know, a launch every 26 months to Mars. And what we want to do in this area is compete small missions at 100, 200, or $300 million level. And, and that could be a mix and match. 
And this draws on experience from uh, the lunar programs, uh, the COTS and the CLIPS programs, and we're looking at different one-step or two-step processes, but this is really becomes kind of our sustainable base for, for the Mars mission to make sure that we, we have opportunities at every launch and for new scientists, uh, for people to you know garner more science data. We also have the medium class missions, and this is where you know an Emily or a search for life type uh, mission would fall into. This is strategic decadal class science, more complex instrument suites, and um, you know scalable to significant discoveries. And then the last uh, area or the last objective in this area is so that we can take advantage of our partners' launch opportunities. So we want to do competed payloads so that we can be flexible to quickly and responsibly respond to any opportunities that come our way, not just the, the base framework that we're planning for, but be able to um, take advantage of, of any opportunity we can to go to Mars. In the area of infrastructure, these are somewhat um, prioritized with a, a separate category for in infrastructure under um, access to Mars. But as I mentioned before, we have the Mars Telecom Network. We no point in doing science if you can't get the science data back. We need to be able to have that science here. High resolution imaging, high rise on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is uh, almost 20 years, it'll be 20 years old in 2025. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we have that uh, capability on Mars. Global meteorological monitoring, I mentioned you know, network science as well as preparing for humans. This is critical in that area. Sample handling and receiving. So that would be the, the, the sample receiving facility that we're preparing for the, the return samples. Ground receiving networks, data infrastructure visual, visualization and analysis. And then in the area of access to Mars, uh, spacecraft delivery. So this would include ride shares, uh, you know, propulsive access, and then payload hosting opportunities. In the area of technology, these are um, not prioritized, but uh, entry descent uh, landing systems and surface access, uh, continuing to evolve our technologies, technologies there, aerial mobility, in-situ surface mobility, novel surface mo mobility, and autonomy. Uh, revolutionizing uh, subsurface access up to hundreds of meters. In situ sample handling, pre processing, and analysis, primary, primarily on the, uh, the sample handling facility. In situ remote sensing and search for evidence of life measurements. Again, this ties back to that search for life SAG and the recommendations for technology development would directly feed into this area. And then uh, lastly, direct to orbit, direct to earth and proximity link telecommunications. And then in the area of, um, you know, uh, DEIA and inclusivity, uh, making sure that our underrepresented communities are involved in, in Mars and exploring Mars. We want to uh, involve and support underrepresented communities through internships, mission teams, leadership training opportunities. We want to enhance the state of the profession in terms of demographics, career opportunities, and having a culture of inclusivity, creating opportunities for public participation new models for community collaboration, and of course, respecting the role in the stewardship of Mars for Humanity. So how does this all tie together? This is the aspirational timeline to a sustainable budget for the Mars Exploration Program. What you'll see here in the swim lanes across, um, we've got Mars sample return across the top, and then we have this this framework or this foundation of, of the new missions, the new science missions, the competed science missions in the next four swim lanes. And we have infrastructure, technology, and international opportunities, the areas that we might want to, to leverage any additional opportunities that we can with our partners. And then you'll also see kind of the budget down here. Um, we've got the past budget, which is everything to the left of the gray dotted line. And you can see we've had a lot of peaks and valleys with, with larger missions. And what we're really, and if you move, remove those, you have really um, a, pretty, a pretty low, just um, baseline budget. And what we're trying to do is get to a sustainable uh, level 
budget, this is easier for strategic planning. It's easier for um, for Congress to understand what we're doing moving forward in terms of a, a sustainable budget that we can manage. So this is, again, this is aspirational given uh, the current environment, current budget constraints right now, but we are looking, um, you know, we're, we're working on technology development now, and then we're looking at um, possible, you know, precursor for the search for life out here in 2030-ish. In and then uh, we've got a whole bunch of more work here with the Mars sample return, but we might have some payloads and some low cost missions that would come in here in the sooner in this um, in this kind of this open area on this timeline. And then path forward, some of the near term activities uh, to achieve the, the objectives for this this future plan, we need to maintain the, the missions that we're operating now and continue to, to have that infrastructure. Um, develop uh, the sample receiving project and the facility, collaborate with ESA on the ExoMars Rosalind Franklin mission, seek low cost opportunities to address critical infrastructure needs, continue invest investments in key mission enabling technologies, including the search for life and subsurface access, public private partnerships. And one I did not mention before is um, we've commissioned the National Academies to help us identify what is the science that the humans could best achieve for, for Mars. And then our Mars, our, our Mars Exploration Program Future Vision is to implement a sustainable portfolio of these low cost competed missions, medium class missions, infrastructure technology, and missions of opportunity, while um, it all being supportive and synergistic with humans at Mars. And so that is the future plan for exploring Mars together. And Lindsay, I think we're waiting until the till the break for questions. Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much, okay. Tiffany. Um, I I always appreciate sort of that that future vision. I think it's great. Um, I'm going to invite Rick and Tomo in whatever order you guys are going to be presenting to take take it from here and to tell us about uh, the International Mars Ice Mapper. Great. And thank you all for this opportunity to talk about this uh, potential mission. Um, I'll say a few words and turn it over to Tomo to say, and then we'll get, to get into the pitch. Um, we have been. Uh, this is a we're. This is just four space agencies that are working together. None of the agencies can afford this mission <laughs> at the present time by themselves, and they're trying to explore a collaboration uh, to do this. Uh, Tiffany mentioned the Emily or life detection mission. Um, and the decadal they envision going into the ice. Um, and so, uh, but the problem is we don't know where the ice is exactly, and we'll try to make that uh, clear. And this mission is intended to close that gap, assuming we can find a path forward. We've talked about this in multiple forms, and, but MEPAG's been the primary one, but Ural's community is really an important element in this whole uh, uh, thrust, if you will, to um, access the ice. And we really want to uh, thankful for the opportunity to come here and uh, chat with you. Tomo, any other other words you want to add? Hey, uh, this is Thomas speaking from JAXA. Uh, uh, to join, like, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a, as, as he said, like, the JAXA is also the, uh, one of the uh, partner agencies, and then this is purely uh, international uh, operations, missions, and then look for the uh, uh, ICE. And also, and also this is, like, uh, this exploration mission for the future uh, Mars mission, the future uh, human mission, but also uh, we have lots of lots of uh, science ingredient uh, topics in it. So oh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tomo. And so we'll go ahead and Lindsay and share our slides now. I believe I believe they are. You, you have them. Yeah, I do, I have them. I've got it. Do you all see them? We do. They look great. I, we see your present. We don't see the presenter version. We see like the the main thing, but we uh, can see your slides. Uh, let me see if I can do presenter. Hold on one second. Uh, no, I, I see. Hang on one second. Sorry, it's a long week, and I'm running. I'm, is that better? That looks great. Okay, great. So we kind of gave an overview. Um, 
Uh, this effort started a number of years ago, actually right before the decadal came out. And the decadal was actually asking many of the same questions, but the big question is what is the grand science questions that can be addressed with the power of humans and machines at Mars and something that's really worthy of the endeavor. And uh, NASA internally, but the other agencies did. And then actually the decadal came back with a very similar answer. And the answer was that search for life um, with access to near surface water ice is a focusing precursor uh, for the ice mapping. Uh, and as a focusing precursor is the ice mapping requirement. And the interesting thing here is that, and this is really a message that I think we could, would convey, which is that accessing the ice is important, not only potential uh, for, all, it's important for a lot of groups. So it's important. It's one of the four main areas I, we know for astrobiology, climatology is there and geology are all uh, enhanced dramatically by being able to drill down and seeing that time dimension there. The other thing is, is that there's a strong synergy with the human space flight in the sense of ISRU needs, where they need significant amounts of water to, uh, to produce methane, which is a, uh, that along with oxygen are key for reducing the overall costs of these missions. So you start to see a really nice synergy here. Now the equipment for drilling is different, but the need to access that subsurface is basically the same. Uh, and so um, this is a highly, this, we are exploring a highly leveraged partnership. I'm not going to mince words. Every agency has significant budget challenges, um, and that's part, that's part of the challenge. But the importance of, uh, and that, those are very real challenges, but the importance of understanding this new dimension at Mars is key. And so these four space, actually five space agencies have been working together, TOMO with Jackson, then you got OZI, CSA, and NASA. NASA, um, and then you also have the Netherlands Space Office. Um, the, most of these agencies already have combinations of science and uh, the art and their Artemis efforts, um, and they and the and most see this as part part of their Moon to Mars overall strategies. The mid-core mission concept, and it's a concept right now. Um, again, acknowledging the budget realities is that the ice, there would be an ice mapping orbiter that would be built um, by Japan, building on their tremendous experience. Canadian Space Agency would provide a synthetic aperture radar. Uh, and so just a, a little bit of, uh, and we'll come back to this point, uh, the current radar at Mars uh, it, it actually um, on the, on MRO really was not designed to look for near surface ice. It was looked for designed to look for deep aquifers. And it was by somewhat by accident that it started finding these massive near surface ice sheets, which is very exciting discovery. But um, the frequency it chose uh, essentially creates a blind spot. So it makes it so in those top zero to 10, zero to 15 meter ranges, you can't really detect where the ice starts. Uh, this mission would also uh, potentially have a VHF sounder and a large deployable reflector, and then also a comm relay. Um, and it would have atmospheric sensors as well. Um, we had a, um, a measurement definition team uh, that was a multinational team with multidiscipline. So it had uh, representatives from all the affected science communities, which would be astrobiology, science. It was really a tremendous team. And we'll have a link to the report here in a moment. But they basically said that in, the radar concept works and that they would strongly recommend having a VHF sounder if money can be found for it, as well as a high resolution imager. And that's where you see uh, the, these elements in this current uh, concept being studied. There would additionally be a uh, potentially a free flying small sat orbiter with a high resolution imager. Um, and that would essentially be a successor to high rise on on MRO if uh, all the pieces can be put together to do this. Tomo, uh, you all have thought so much about it. Anything you want to add here? Yep. Uh, so uh, as you see here, like uh, uh, we are going to provide a small piggyback uh, demo lander. This is the, uh, partly because like JAXA has a strategic uh, Mars exploration program in which 
uh, we need a small demo lander for the future big rovers. And this is just a, uh, of course, this is not just a small demo lander for ice mapper, but also the uh, a demo lander would provide the ice mapper mission, like uh, ground truthing uh, about the about the presence of ice in the state of the ice uh, of the uh, of the landing areas. Thank you. Yeah, Tomo, thank you so much for adding. I completely bit flipped that. So thank you, because that's a critical piece, because it essentially, um, you can image that lander, and it would also have an ability to verify what we're, what we're, was is being seen from on orbit. Okay, uh, next slide. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Hang on one second. So... Uh, the primary purpose here, and these are goals coming out of the mission concept, which is to map and characterize the near surface ice. I'll show you some, we will show you some maps in a moment uh, using all our current sensors and to try to get, do a best guesstimate of where the ice sheets are. Um, and you'll see that here in a moment. Um, and then, hang on one second. And then analyze the evidence of ice-related subsurface structure. So you not only under, want to understand the ice, you also want to understand what's on top of it, so that as you drill down through it, you have better insight into the challenges of the drilling. And if you're looking at towards the, the eventual human operations that Tiffany alluded to, you know what you're landing on and the bearing strength of the those of that uh, surface to withstand the uh, landing loads from arriving spacecraft. Uh, so that's kind of the general, and then really to understand the climatological as well as the potential habitat environments on Mars better is a, the, a major objective here. Okay, I'm not sure why this is. Sorry, I'm having a few challenges there. And so these are the. Um, uh, the partner agencies are looking at this study, and these are the dual reconnaissance and science objectives. And so water ice is a is major focus. And it's, again, it's, uh, if you, in the, the U.S. decadal, and it's really mirrored at all the partner sites, uh, this access to ice. So they envisioned the, in our, the U.S. decadal, for example, they assumed a mapping uh, a mission like this. And then they have Emily that goes in and does a robotically controlled access of the ice, followed by humans arriving, hopefully with an, someone from the astrobiology community on the crew, doing a subsurface drilling, potentially coring into the ice in multiple locations to really and bring back samples that way. Um, and so understanding where that ice is, when MRO went um, uh, with Sherrod, again, it did not have the ability to see in close, and you really want to minimize how deep you have to go with initial drilling, and we've seen this on the insight, it's difficult. And so the art becomes finding locations um, that are close to the surface that you can access the ice for both science and for ISRU and minimize how much drilling you have to do from the engineering standpoint. You also want it as close to the equator as you can uh, because for launch operations, it, the closer you are to the equator, just like on Earth, is, is highly preferred so that you can get off of it. So the art becomes finding locations that are outstanding for science, but that are also as close to the equator as possible to minimize the amount of energy needed to get off the planet. Also, we've talked about the terrain. We want to know how much regolith is on top of these deposits. We want to understand how porous it is. We understand the low bearing strength of it and understand how rough the terrain is. And then we also want to understand the hydrosphere in general, as well as the cryosphere, and, and um, because those are all key elements going forward. Tomo, anything you want to add here? No, at this moment. Okay. Uh, we aren't standing still. We've actually been take, doing mapping efforts for almost five years to try to understand where the ice is. Um, we've taken the Sherrod data, we've taken impact craters, we've taken Themis data, every kind of data sets, and actually have, are just a, about publishing the, this result, which is a map of our best guess of where the ice deposits are at Mars. That green line you see here is our using all these instruments, and they're all giving you different views into where ice is, is, is an estimate of the ice boundary line. 
the white lines are a primary imaging uh, uh, that you would want to do with a synthetic aperture radar once you, we get one out to Mars. That's the primary one, but in the end, you really want to image as much of the planet as possible to really understand how these ice deposits, how they, where they're located, and how thick they are, uh, for all the reasons that all of us, uh, you know, collectively would make, given the the large interest in this this kind of area. Tom, anything you want to add here? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Hang on one second. I'm not sure why this thing is so slow to change. Sorry. Oh, hang on there. It did go finally. So these are the Im when you take those white lines, these are the Im initial imaging areas, but you we would want to be imaging as much of the planet as possible. And as Tiffany alluded to, one of the, the choke points is the calm back to Mars. One thing that's exciting about this mission as it's currently being conceptualized is it has a six meter dish that can blast data back to Earth. So that's that's uh, 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 will be key for pumping data back because synthetic aperture radars involve a lot of data. And so the, these, these things really tie together nicely. Uh, this is coming out of the decadal, but it talks about that mid-latitude mapping. And it talks about the robotic eye sampling in the mid 2030s. And then when humans getting there, you're accessing it for science, which would be coring into that ice like they do in Antarctica, as well as um, for ISRU purposes. ISRU purposes will not happen immediately. That is, at least in the NASA architectures, they won't. And that's completely understandable. But it is so difficult to drill at Mars that you want to get going on understanding those deposits as soon as possible. And anyway, these are the references to the U.S. planetary decadal there below for your reference. So we... Um, these agencies came up with a, a course on emissions, and I mentioned, uh, Tiffany actually mentioned it, the measurement, we did have an international measurement definition team. We had 147 highly qualified applications, 53 were selected across the planet, and they had excellent, they had expertise in all the areas, including astrobiology, uh, radar, ISRU, and the team composition, as I noted earlier, spread across planetary science and human exploration. It was an amazing team. And 10 countries were represented, and we had diversity across gender and career stages. And their report basically confirmed the core concept of the radar, and it also highly recommended moving, having a high-resolution camera as well as a VH imager, VHF radar to really help um, characterize this. And so the agencies are actually studying those additions to see you know, what it would take to do those, assuming funds could be found. Tomo, anything you want to add here? No, it's perfect. Thank you. OK. Good. Um, so the key point here is the NBT uh, science topics considered. They want to maximize science to the greatest possible. Um, and so these are the um, uh, key areas of focus, but we've pretty much talked through those. Any Tomo, anything else you want to add here? Thanks. That's good. Yep. And then here is a QR code to actually the report. We strongly welcome, uh, welcome you to go look at it. And even uh, we would love to get feedback, too. Um, uh, and then, uh, uh, so that is, I think you'll find that to be an, a really tremendous report. And anyway, Lindsay, that's pretty much a quick overview. I will turn it back over to Tomo to see if he thinks I missed anything. And then we're delighted to try to answer questions. But again, uh, this is really a an incredibly fascinating synergy, synergistic mission, if the funds can be found, um, that would combine astro, uh, astrobiology, geology, climatology, and prep the way for you, real, what many of us feel would be an incredibly exciting uh, mission, a mission for when crews arrive there. Anyway, Tomo, anything else that you think I missed? No, that's it, perfect, but I got, uh, the Please, please go to the MDT report. Like you can just Google it, like uh, uh, MDT report. I my So like uh, we have a very nice like uh, uh, report. So yeah, please check it.
Yeah, and I would I might add one thing. The technology of this kind of a mission is challenging, but what's really fascinating is that there are incredible agencies across the planet that working together can make things happen. And and it's just a it's a pleasure been working with Tomo and his entire team and as well as everybody. It's really very forward looking. Everyone's trying to figure out a way to make something really cool happen. So thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Rick and Tomo and, and Tiffany, all for their great presentations. Um, I think we've got time for questions, and I think I think you guys actually got us right back on time. So thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, always always uh, on time and under budget, right? Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, let's do a couple questions now. Um, and in fact, uh, Daniela, if possible, do I think there were a couple questions about uh, Mars-related things. So let's start with those. And then if we have time, we can go back to some of the questions um, that were they're more related to some of the earlier presentations. Sounds good. Okay, a couple of questions in the chat while you all are here. One, did I miss the depth of the mapping that you're aiming for? Is this just near surface or are you looking for map looking to map some sufficient depth? Yeah, so I can start at that and see what Tomo has to add. Um, you know, we're really trying to close the zero to 10 meter range. Now, the synthetic aperture radar uh, can, you know, depending on the conditions, you know, it, you, you you may not get down that low. That's one of the reasons why the a VHF sounder was also recommended to help us better characterize these deposits. But again, we're trying to close that loop because it's so hard to drill there that you want to minimize how deep you go. And if you can get the zero to 10 meters, you probably are going to find some amazingly interesting uh, science sites as well as ISRU capabilities. And you don't have to do the whole planet for that. You just have to really find some outstanding sites. And, and that's probably, and I think that's victory given the frequencies that are available to us. Tomo, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, as he said, like uh, we call it uh, accessible ice, the accessible by the uh, human exploration, and uh, start with like a very limited uh, exploration zone. But I, hopefully, we're gonna try to map out uh, the globally uh, if the uh, the spacecraft uh, will survive. So, thanks. Okay, great. Another one. Um, is how do members of the community get to engage with the Search for Life SAG? Asking as a big supporter of Mars Life Explorer. Tiffany, do you want to take this one? No, I would love it if you would take this one, please. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so that's actually something that we're we're looking to spin up soon. Um, that you know we we have uh, you know some folks at the Mars Program Office and some astrobiology folks that are actually working together um, on this to to pull this together. And so um, it, that's that's another uh, preview of coming attractions. Another uh, watch this space. Um, I am a hundred percent certain that once that you know that once the once we have a tour in place and you know the open for applications that kind of thing, uh, that we will uh, advertise that through the Astrobiology newsletter. Um, so the same way you found out about coming to this town hall today um, is the same way you'll find out about how to participate in that SAG. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, here's more of a philosophical one for you. If there are Martian microbial communities, which steps could we take so that humans don't interfere ecologically? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I will I will start a quick answer to it and then invite you know anybody else anybody from who's on this call at this time to sort of to peek to to answer a bit. You know, I, I'd say that the way that we the, the first step is the is to answer the if question, right? Um, and and to start you know the exploration things like Mars sample return, um, things like the search for life SAG, those types of you know the search for life mission, those types of things are are really helping us to uh, think about what that what life would be like and and how would we would um, understand what it was like and how we could make sure that you know keep biospheres separated of course I'll also note that you know the whole idea of uh, the, the way we approach planetary protection for a 
lot of our missions um, is to is to assume that that's the case um, and treat our missions uh, in such in that way, such that we make sure that you know that we are not inadvertently doing that before we recognize um, that there is some uh, that there is life on some planet. But you know, I'd like to I'd like to encourage other folks uh, to answer this question. We also have you know uh, we have some Mars experts here, but we also have some uh, more philosoph philosophical space exploration people. So um, who wants to to take it next? I'll, I'll start if that's all right. Um, I, I just want to uh, call out that, you know, Coast Bar maintains uh, knowledge gap documents. They have a knowledge gap, a new release, I think that just came out this year, earlier this year for um, human missions to Mars. And it does assume that MSR uh, samples have been brought back and that those have been assessed but they do maintain a knowledge gap document. They talk about the, the things that we need to do before we go um, you know, to Mars and explore these areas. So I, I encourage folks to go out and look at that, that knowledge gaps document. Yeah, this is Rick. I'll, I'll just add a, a few points to they, uh, Lindsay and Tiffany have done a great job. I, I would just add that one, we do this in Antarctica, we look for extremophiles in drilling and so, you know, we should be trying to leverage those lessons absolutely as much as possible. You know, some of the mitigations is you, you know, you control your operations downwind, not upwind, you know, as an example. And then um, and there are a lot of things they're doing there. And so we need to leverage those lessons learned. The human space flight systems, I spent probably 25 years doing that stuff. It's not going to be clean. So that's just calling a spade a spade. It doesn't mean that we can't do uh, civilization changing science uh, by doing that. We just have to figure out a strategy that works across all the communities. And the third thing I would say is rather than frame it as a problem, and, and your question really didn't do that, but some people do, um, you know, ask the question, how can humans accelerate the search for life in a safe way? Um, because that is um, that's that's probably the reality, and we might as well embrace it and figure out how we accelerate that this amazing search for life. Anyone else, Linda or David, want to want to say anything else about this one as well? I think the answers you've all given so far are, are really good. I would just like to acknowledge that it's a good question, that this is a challenge for us, because the most interesting places to go on Mars are also the, potentially the places <laughs> where we're at most risk of of you know interacting with something interesting that we don't want to harm. So it, but it's something that we take very seriously, and um, you know that there's a lot of thought that goes into this. And, and, and as Rick said, um, that you know that we do have some experience in environments on Earth trying to sort of do safe exploration in this way, and we're going to apply all those lessons to Mars. And um, uh, yeah, so we, we appreciate the question, and it's it's something that we really do take seriously. Yeah, and um, just to add, uh, you can access NASA's planetary protection policy documents online, um, and um, I'll post a link in chat to an announcement from almost exactly a year ago about the NASA release of a new planetary protection standard. Um, and as Tiffany mentioned, uh, COSPAR and NASA make sure that their policies are uh, parallel. Um, so we're all um, working from the same page. So I'll post that link in a second. Thanks, Linda. I just wanted to add, too, relative to what we were talking about before with respect to field work, you know, and just having everyone involved in the search for life bear their responsibilities in mind that, you know, anything we would we would find out there has rights and we have responsibilities to protect it. Okay. I'll go back. Next, next. Next question. Let's see. Okay, this is a little bit specific. Are there any updates on the Rio Tinto analog site for current acid environment astrobiology research? That's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, I know that we we continue. It is a, continues to be an active site uh, astrobiologically. Um, they, I'm going to highlight it too because there may be some folks. Um, 
on on the chat who can actually respond to it and and you know reach out to this individual um, or that they could reach out to and and really uh, start some communications and some conversations. Um, but just broadly, you know, it is it is an important site for astrobiology and um, it's one that we continue to to study. Anyone else have other answers, other comments? Okay, thanks, Daniela. Next. Okay. Would NASA use energy-based radiation shielding for human travel or material defenses from cosmic rays? David, I think this one is for you. Hmm. Um, energy-based radiation shielding. Um, I have to confess, I'm not exactly sure um, what you mean, but um, but the, there is, of course, a huge interest in um, uh, how we um, how how life is affected and protected uh, affected by and protected from ionizing radiation that overlaps several of our enterprises. It's it's obviously a fundamental question for astrobiology uh, in terms of. Um, uh, limits on habitability, um, and it's also it's a really important question for for human exploration, uh, in terms of safety of uh, future astronauts, uh, say on Mars and in in trans yeah, in, in deep space. And it's one of the areas where um, we um, will. I, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm sort of exploring areas of, of overlap between some of the. Um, science mission, um, uh, some of the some of the uh, divisions in science mission directorate, and this is an area I've already had some conversations with uh, biological and physical sciences um, because they are um, very interested in in these questions of different kinds of radiation shielding and radiation limits and tolerances uh, for for this astronaut um, safety question, and and we as astrobiologists are interested in it uh, just as sort of a fundamental uh, limits of life life question. So, so it's uh, something that we um, will continue to look at and I think foster new um, uh, cross-divisional um, research projects on. And if, if anybody who has, you know, new and good ideas about this, uh, we're, we're, we're all ears. We want to, we want to know about it. Yeah. And this is Rick. I might just add one thing real fast. So it is a tool set for protecting humans, uh, creating a magnetic field, because that's basically what uh, the, uh, what the uh, magnetic fields right. around the Earth are. Thanks. They're essentially deflectors, and you can do that around spacecraft, and you could potentially do that on the ground, I imagine. The, the other cut tricks in the trade is you wrap water around them, because water is a really good attenuator. So you store all your water where the crew is sleeping, for example. Um, and then the third one is just there's certain materials, dense materials like leads that are very good for attenuating other types of radiation. And in the end, it's unless you have a solar flare, it's it's an aggregate um, total dosage that you worry about. And there are lots of really clever tricks that we can do to reduce that total level down so that, that it's manageable. One idea is even, a, I think it's a Norwegian um, uh, architect I had, is that just have the crew when they're on Mars sleep underground and then stay up above ground during the day. And you're reducing that REM exposure down because it's a lifetime exposure. So there's a lot of ideas. And, but the one you're asking about is, is definitely one that's in the in the uh, bag of tools, if you will. Thanks. Fantastic, Daniela. Why okay. don't we one more question, and then I think we can uh, wrap it up for the for the day. Wonderful. Okay. Can you shed some light on the role of artificial intelligence and/or machine learning in NASA missions? Um. I'll start, I can start um, and see what others have to add. So I come out of the aerospace world and there is a real hesitation to use dense chips for understandable reasons because you can get single event upsets that completely tank the computer and we have them occur all the time in spacecraft. Um, the new commercial entrants have been doing some very interesting and informative things of having multiple modern computer. Well, let me back it up. Well, for us, we tend to use older computers where we understand the risk to radiation. Uh, the newer companies are doing using modern computers, but they just bring up five of them. And if one of them dies, they can see that it's died and the other four take over. And that way they're able to stay with state-of-the-art uh, computers. 
we need, I, I personally believe we need to really um, build on that knowledge and because the artificial intelligence systems are gonna even denser computers in terms of chips. Um, and so that will be a transition. But when you're talking about Mars, the time delays almost force you to have a uh, artificial intelligence aid there to help um, uh, facilitate the interaction between the flight control teams and uh, the, either the robots or the humans and the robots there. In fact, the artificial intelligence will probably be there. And so uh, it's a really rich frontier in terms of uh, the opportunities we can enable for both our robotic missions and our human and robotic missions going forward, I believe. And we're gonna need a lot of ideas is the, the message I would share with that. And that's at least some ideas on that. And I'm happy to provide a, a slightly different perspective um, in terms of autonomy versus AI versus machine learning. Um, generative AI is, is, I think, what a lot of people mean when they say AI, but um, also people mean autonomy. And we are all about autonomy. Uh, terrain relative navigation is how we landed Perseverance on Mars. Um, machine learning has been utilized for data analysis in terms of crater mapping of both the Mars and Moon and other um, areas. So those are areas we definitely um, encourage uh, AI, machine, machine learning, or autonomy in terms of generative AI, uh, you know, chat GPT and, and things along that lo those lines. I think, you know, we're still learning, still trying to understand how we can utilize it, um, but it is not, you know, part of our current uh, baseline for technology development. Yeah, just to add, I completely agree with Tiffany. I was actually referring to the latter one. I, having sat on flight control teams for years, I will tell you, we're not going to have flight control teams for human missions to Mars. They're going to be flight support teams. And that means you're going to need to be exploring that frontier a lot to really understand. And I believe it can be, I personally believe it can be used for robotic missions and, and the flight control teams that can be used there too. But we have to learn how to do that. Thank you both, all, everyone who spoke today, who contributed, who gave presentations, who answered questions. Um, I will say, I understand there was one question or one couple couple different questions in the chat that were about specifics about uh, some of our research programs from some of the earlier presentations. I'm just gonna reiterate, um, you can find the contact for those people, the program contacts um, at the ends of the calls, and I encourage you to reach out to them. Um, reach out to folks that talked here today. Uh, David has been very open about asking for people to reach out to him. I, of course, am always interested in uh, hearing feedback from folks. Um, I'm going to say, you know, Rick and Tiffany and Tomo agree and are interested in, in hearing from you all. Um, so I will just wrap us up. I will finish us off by saying um, thank you all who presented and chatted and answered questions today. Thank you all who attended for coming and listening. Um, and, you know, we hope to do this again uh, to talk about different astrobiological topics, to hear from maybe some different missions, that type of thing. Um, uh, in going forward. So thank you all. Have a great uh, Friday, the rest of your weekend. This recording will be available. A lot of the links that we mentioned, we're going to try and put on the program website. So have a great one. And uh, this is the Astrobiology Program Town Hall signing off. Mm -hmm.